That's like a thing. That's the thing people do. Is like, and they hold yeah. up a video, nah, and they let you, you like. They froze. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You don't move. I say too many things I don't want out there, so I never. Right. Ah. Uh. All right. What's going on, everyone? Welcome to episode 31 of Menace and the Man. Menace here, Stan the Man. We're joined by Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu MMA legend Henzo Gracie. Great to be here with you guys. Bro. How are you today, Henzo? If you get any better, I'll be suspicious. No, oh, it's one of those Still days. Oh, wow. It was, it nice. Exactly like yesterday, the day before. It never gets bad. Always positive. Of course. Always positive. That's Doesn't one of the things I love much. about you. You're like that guy in the MMA community. It's like never <laughs> any negativity, anything like that. I love that. So while I was getting ready to come over here, I put on my shirt and I was like, "Look at I this." Like, I was like, "I was like, man, I, what, what, I got a question. Like, you just put on a shirt. And you're like, dude, I, I'm gonna break out of this thing. <laughs> you almost break the shirt. <laughs> that, that's one. And then two, I brought my fanny pack. Ah. So I feel like that's something that Henzo. What people don't understand, this is the best tour a man could have, and they made out of fashion. They say if you wear this, is unless you're fat. unless you're manly, like that manly, that you're like I don't give a fuck what anyone yeah. says about my fanny. Because I've seen you in pictures. With I your fanny love pack. this. Yeah. Like my whole life I had this. You always rock the fanny pack. Always beautiful. But now I don't have anymore. You know, now I'm getting. You know what I'm doing? Cargo pants with like five oh, pockets. Oh wow! So you, <laughs> wow. Oh, yeah. Someone, bunch of pockets, yeah. The way someone said that the fanny packs went out, they'd probably say cargo pants went out yes, too. Yes, 15, 20 no, years fanny ago. Fanny packs are back. Fanny packs yeah, are back in right now. Yeah, yeah. The Rock has one. Danaher. Danaher. Oh. Yeah. I would say The Rock. Once The Rock put the fanny pack on. Then it was cool. Yeah, yeah. then it was like acceptable. I, I, have you ever met The Rock? Yes, yes, yes. Great uh, guy. Great yeah? Guy, yeah? I'd imagine Hensel's met everybody. Uh, I, I, I was lucky because since I was. On this sport since the beginning, everybody that is starting to embrace this sport and he supports uh, Shane McMahon trains here. Oh, yeah. So oh, went, is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I went in many shows of WWE, I took my kids, you know. Like, one of my questions I definitely have for you is why did Henzo choose New York? Like, I know Hoist and a lot of the other ones, they went up in California. I know, like, Laborio, a lot of the other Brazilians, they like Florida. I'm comfortable with Florida, with Florida or, 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 or California, LA or California yeah. because it resembles the weather yeah. they had in Brazil. I never thought I could leave Brazil. I thought my whole life of being in Brazil, working there, living there, teaching Jiu-Jitsu there, until the day that I came. And I travel everywhere. Then I came to New York. When I came to New York, I fell in love. I thought New York was the the, 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 the crossroads of the world, you know? Like, you could find anything here. Yeah. You have little Brazil on 46, you have little Israel on 47, mm -hmm. you have little Italy, China, you have everything. Chinatown that I was cleaning, after I beat up that bouncer for 10 days, <laughs> I had the best time of my life cleaning that, cleaning that place. You know? Oh, those are some of our favorite stories here at Medicine and Man. We like to keep it positive, but we love street fight stories course, too. So it's like, yeah. What's more positive than a street fight? Oh, uh, you educate people, yeah. or you oh. get educated. It's always like this. Well, that solves everything. Yeah, of course. I would think now nobody's trying you though. 20 well, years now, ago, maybe. Now I, 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 what I learned. 20 years ago, I you make fun of them. You were probably that guy who had almost too much machismo, no, had too much swag. No, I'm there. saying like not like that you were uh, be putting it out there. You just had confidence about yourself because you were a yeah, world class so jiu-jitsu guy. What you don't realize, people insult you, and they are used to do this on a daily basis to everybody. Yeah. So someone needs you touch you with a little reality. So unfortunately, I did that to a lot of people because they <laughs> but I could see the difference between someone that was used to do this to people who weren't. Were you, were you there when Matt Sarah put that drunk guy no, down? No, I was no. sent me the video, I was laughing. Uh, so these things happen all the time. I know. Normally, we don't get involved with that goal, but there's moments in life you need to, to, to intervene. You, know, you have the power to intervene and stop that. Now, were you, I know like uh, a lot of the Gracies always preach like that technique and whatnot. Were they all street fighters or? Like I remember the old school Gracie challenge was gym fights. They weren't yes. getting in fights in the streets, no, right? Fight in the street, no. I yeah. was the only one. Me, you and Ryan. I, 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 yeah. The three of us. Because when I moved to... Uh, oh, Ralph, Ralph too. Yeah, yeah. Ralph yeah. Too, yeah. He's the angriest one. Yeah, he seems yeah. like the angriest he's, Gracie. He's the dangerous one. Yeah. <laughs> the yeah. real dangerous one. But the thing was, when we moved to Baja, there was so much crime. That was... Back then, the streets were still dirt. The week that I moved in, they... They kill a woman coming back from the church. They rape her and they, they, they strangle her. Right next in, to my house. In Baja. In Baja. Yeah. So I say, you know, back then it was like farms there. So I say, we're going to leave here, we're going to fix this. So I put a team together and I, 
I put a flag up, a pirate flag up, and I grew up with the guys from that movie, City of God. They went, they went to school and they became drug dealers after. So I could approach them, I could go talk to them. They are good friends of mine. So I went to them and I said, look, make sure that when you sell drugs, tell them never to use it or to bring it from this piece or this piece of the beach. I said, I don't want to see drugs there. And they always did this. Right from Baja, you know you cannot use drugs by the camera mark when I grew up. Right, right. So we were able to clean the whole area. We, there was no more theft, no more rapes, never. There was one that we, almost happened, and I arrived when, when it was happening. He had a knife in his hand, and he was getting actually my friend's wife, you know, with the, trying to bring her inside the bushes. And I, I, I drove by by chance. It was me and Pito, the guy who did Jiu-Jitsu in Florida. I jumped out of the car, and I chased him with knife without a knife, you know, and he actually cut her hand. But she was fine. She just had to do stitches on her hand. And so things like that. So finally we cleaned the whole place. And then that my mom moved out of the house. The house was a big house right on the corner. We had 10 bedrooms plus the, 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 the maid's headquarters. What I did, I, I, I transformed into a clinic for all the kids that had problems with drugs, that had problems with alcohol, you know, that they couldn't, do, they couldn't eat well, they were overweight. I put them in a house. I put them to train jiu-jitsu, I made them stop drinking, do the right diet. Today, many of them have jiu-jitsu academies, by the way. Oh, you know, wow, they follow that's and then I was telling you a story, and then one very famous one calls me, goes, Hansel, I was one of those kids. I was 12 when I moved to the house. I, said, I remember, <laughs> you know? And how long ago was this? I, I was, I was, I began this, like, strongly, I was 14 years old. I'm 52 wow. now, yeah. So I was 14. And then I kept the house from my mom move out. I was 16 when she moved out. So I stayed there with my brother until I was 22. And that's when I decided to move. That's when you came to the United States. No, I actually moved to my mom's house. Nice house with jacuzzi in the room. In Brazil. Yes. And when I decided to move and close the, the, the clinic, the, they call it the Hanzu County. That's how the police call it. The police loved me. They yeah, I was going to say, yeah. they had no problem so with you. So when I decided to close the house and leave my mom's house, the police came and offered me a salary. They said, yes, can you keep doing what you're doing? We'll give you a salary, and we'll give you, we pay for all the expenses of the house. The food, the, the, the utilities, and you keep doing what you're doing. I said, man, I had enough of crazy people. That's it. Now I need to live for myself. I want to be a fighter, and I have a pet to follow. So then I stopped. Now, I just get... Uh, the news from the from the governor for Rio and the mayor of Rio de Janeiro that they passed a law they're gonna give me a statue on this beach. Oh wow! Unbelievable! Yeah. They just passed. So they sent me the message. The videos. Dude, that we got that proof. is cool. That's we amazing. They go. You want a a a, a, a bus <laughs> from no. here up? Well, what do you yeah. want in the whole pile? Yeah. I said I, I never I never did nothing halfway. So let's do the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> and then they start laughing. And I knew his yeah. will be yeah. So So uh. it's a very, it's a very different situation because the first time they give a statue to someone alive. So I hope I can be still alive until September. Yeah, to be. yeah, yeah. Now is the statue gonna be you in a gi or you in like your fighting? In reality, it's gonna be me in a gi, half a gi and half in a surfing shorts with my surfing board. So, so like. Yes, yes. That's, That's pretty amazing. cool. Yeah. In Rio? In Rio, yeah. Wow. You yeah. surf? I was, yeah, I was very good at surf. When was the last time you surf? Uh, the last time was actually in the pool in Abu Dhabi. In all in. They uh, have a, a way surf to the yeah, surf pool. Yeah. That was the last one I did. Yeah, but I have to go back. I'm soon I'm going to go back. Where are you going to go to Long Island? I did a few times. Rockaway. Yeah, but it's not the same. Not right? the same. Long Beach I did. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I surf. I like big waves. Yeah. I surf a lot. of Peru. Costa Rica. Yeah. So now give me a year, like when did you hit New York? That was 1996. 96 is when you first got here? Yes. You didn't, was this where you first came in America? I this no, is where you... I actually I came here when I was 18 years old. I lived with Caesar Gracie, mm -hmm. the coach for the yeah, yeah. brothers. Yeah, yeah. I went there to live there for six months. And then when I came back, I brought him with me to Brazil so he could learn Jiu Jitsu too. And that's how he began. That was 1985. Yeah, like I told yeah. him even, he wouldn't be sitting here if it yeah. wasn't for Henzo Gracie. Yeah. Like your lineage is where we started and where we trained and Depot and Joe D'Arcy and all those guys. All like, those guys, yeah. And even I always say like, what would Jiu-Jitsu on the East Coast be if you didn't come here? Yeah. You know, like 
uh, Marcelo Garcia, all those other, they came after you. Yes, all those yes. other Brazilians probably saw it out. All, all came yeah, after yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, well, he was affiliated with us for a while. We know a lot of the guys from there. and just I always looked at it, though, like every Brazilian, to me, came after you. You know what I mean? Like almost like before Christ or True, yeah. before Henzo or after Henzo. You know what I mean? I believe the first time I was here was 1992 or 93. Yeah. It was right before the UFC. When it was getting the beginning, yeah. so I came to do some instructional tapes with Craig Hooker and then get the word out. Then the people want to hire me for seminars all the time. And then I begin coming back a lot. I said, well, let me move to New York. Do you remember Napster and LimeWire where you could download videos? Yes, yes. So, and I had like dial up. So I had I had the Henzo Gracie like highlight reel, the Hoist highlight reel, with the Bob Sap, Bob Sap, Bob Sap, yeah. wow. and Vanderlei were yeah. like my I like. Could, I couldn't believe the other day they tried to commemorate 20 years. Yeah. Oh yeah. Time yeah. flies. Oh. Time flies. And I just thought it was really cool to watch, but I, and at the time I was like I can never do that. <laughs> and then I don't know. And then you begin training, you begin building confidence next year. Yeah. Too. It's a walking apart. Well, the thing is, when I was watching it, like, you would be fighting about There was no weight class. Yeah, I'm no like, these are just no animals. Bugs, yeah. 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 No, you had the cool blue ones. No, I, this was after. When I began, when I fought that out of, still, my hand is crooked because I broke when I punched him in the face. Yeah. I hit him on the, on the cheek and yeah. I broke the bone. Six months, I couldn't shake nobody's hand. Yeah. And now what? No surgery or nothing back nothing, then. No yeah. It was a different world back then. Yes. Almost. Yeah. It was the way they were supposed to be. Yeah, like, yeah. Fight, like the fight doctor then was like, yeah, you're good. Look, you're yeah. you're breathing, you're good. Not even x ray. Yeah. Well, like a gladiator kind of mindset. Where yeah. like, and it's amazing because today I think I was, when I began fighting those, I was 155 pounds, 150 pounds. Really? And I thought I was the biggest guy yeah. on earth. Yeah. You know? And I remember because I went up from 145 to 150, 155. And I felt like. And you fought everybody. I fought guys 235. Like even what was Tartaro? He was. 230. Yeah, he was yeah. huge. Yeah, I fought yeah. Maurice Smith. He was like over. Heavyweight, 230. Yeah. They all had weights. Yeah. Huge. And then his little Brazilian. And the only reason guy. I fought him was because he didn't. He was saying, Hells, there I go. Who do you want to fight from the Grace? He goes, Royce, Hicks. What about Hells? He goes, Hells is too small. You know? So then I signed up. I said, Only with one condition I fight on this event. Is if I can fight on the first, I can fight uh, Maurice. Get me the biggest motherfucker yeah, you've so got. Maurice Smith. Put me on his bracket. Yeah. What, so, yeah. What's the mindset fighting someone that's at that pro level that's that much bigger than you? Like, for me, like, I'm getting ready to fight this guy. Like, I know I'm stronger than him. You I know I'm faster than him. Yeah. You know, like, if I'm fighting someone that's 240, like, all right, I know I'm faster than him. I know I might be a better technical, but like I'm probably not stronger than it's, that. It's a, it's a funny thing, but I was raised with the idea of fighting no time limit. I didn't want to fight in Japan or kick with it. The guy was like 40, 45 pounds heavier than me. We fought for 51 minutes. Yeah. It was five rounds of 10, and then when we begin the next one, the first minute I got, I did a kick him with the army side. But I remember I couldn't move the guy. And this guy after came to not lose a fight for 31 matches. Straight. That's how tough this guy yeah. was. And he won the Abu Dhabi competition as a grappler, you know. Unbelievable judo guy, but very good jiu-jitsu too. And, and in my head, I, I believed my whole life that I could fight anybody. That was not about size, it was about I had to find a way to win, you know. That's what happened with Takarov. Like I remember the commentators were right behind me and they were like this. Now the Russian best gonna go to work. You guys watch. What? Don't blink because you may finish quick. Like he's gonna yeah, finish yeah. quick. And it was a very funny situation when I walk in the elevator with Tatarov. And he never saw me, and I never saw him, but I knew who he was. He was fighting UFC. When I walk in, he start eyeballing my 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 training partner because he was a heavyweight. Thinking that was you, or thinking he that was fighting. Thinking that that was the guy that he was gonna fight. Uh, so he looked like, and I'm looking. I'm with. I had back then one of those. Hand computers, yeah, yeah, the yeah. Person yeah. Number. I'm looking at him, I want to laugh because he's thinking, Oh, this is a big guy that I'm fighting, you know, this is a crazy guy. Yeah. And then when they call for the way in, the line for, for pictures, me and him, and I took the clothes, he look, and then he look at the big guy, and he goes, oh, If I knew, I, I would set up today to go smoke a joint, have some shot of vodka in a street club. 
I'm going to follow you or we're going to do that. Otherwise, <laughs> no. Otherwise, I'm going to have chicken for dinner yeah. tomorrow. <laughs> so the day before the fight, I'm having the Russian chicken for, for dinner yeah. tomorrow. Uh, I love yeah. it. No, because when I first started fighting, a similar mindset. It didn't matter who I fought, especially like before the UFC. I would just, hey, Dad, you want to fight this guy? Yep. Whatever. And I would show up. And I didn't know who my opponent was until I saw some guy at weigh-ins like looking at me weird. I'm like, oh, that must be my guy because yeah. he's eyeballing me hard, you know? That's I remember, exactly, yeah. I remember this one guy eyeballing me hard and um, I'm like, that, you know, that must be my guy, whatever, to talk to my friends. And then he gets on the scale, 175. And I was like, oh, that's not my guy. Dennis, come here. What's up? Your opponent's 20 pounds overweight. I'm like, holy cow. Yeah. What do you want to do? I'm like, I'm here to fight. That's it. Let's do it. Man. No, because uh, BJ Penn fought, who was a huge, he fought Machida once. Fought Machida. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was like, I could do that. Yeah. I was convinced I could beat BJ Prime in his, pe- yeah. in his, in his prime. Unbelievable. Well, you know? BJ made that one statement that I always equate back to jiu-jitsu. Like when I first learned jiu-jitsu, I had similar thoughts, but I didn't say it the way he said it. When he first learned jiu-jitsu, he was like, yo, I could run Hawaii with this shit. Like that's how confident he was because he yeah. knew jiu-jitsu. You know yeah. what I mean? Like I feel yeah, like it's a funny situation. that's how you guys were probably when yeah, you first got here. We got to do a lot of the business of selling martial arts with self-confidence. Yeah. yeah. That's what we have. It's a bit, well, that's people what I was change saying. completely. You see people walking in here, secure, with everything in life. In a couple of months, they became a different person. You know, they that, that's what I was saying to you about 20 years ago. You didn't have like an ego. You just had confidence that people were probably like, why is this little guy so confident right now? Like, I'm about to kick his ass. And then, true. yeah, and then it wound up not being good. It was a very funny situation. I went to put oil in my car, and the guy looks at me. Then he looks at me, he sees my ear. And he goes, you wrestle. See, yeah. And then he goes, you don't think you could take He was huge. He was like 6'4", 300 pounds. He goes, do you think you can take me? I go, yeah, very easy. And then was silent. He didn't say nothing. He stopped. He did, I say, do you want to go in the back? <laughs> Quick. Now we. He goes, no, no, thank you. Sir, this, this is your bill, sir. And he came, sir, immediately. Yeah. Sir, this is your bill. <laughs> and then he walked away. He was probably used because of his size to do this to people. You know? And there was another one was with Mark Coleman. Oh, right. Because remember, my home will walk three races in one night. So when I came to fight, I fought three times in one night, the, the World Combat, 1995. Mark Homer was there. They invited him. He was the champion of the UFC. He was sitting there. I came over and go, right after the party, after the thing. Mark, I love the way that you fight. You know the sign that you walk in, three races in one night? I want to be the first. <laughs> can, can we do it? Can we do it on the parking lot now? There's a parking lot empty. We go there now and then we come back for the party. He goes, You're crazy, man. You. No, you're crazy, man. That was my man. He's a stupid guy. Oh, come here, you're crazy. And then the other thing was made for him. I said, Don't you know? You could have beat me up on the parking lot. And you, you know, say no, you know? You know what's so crazy? It's like uh, nowadays, right? The All the shit talking in MMA no. and like. He, if he was mic'd up, doing oh my these God. things, yeah, yeah. would have oh annihilated. God. Yeah, would have killed. You know what I mean? Like unbelievable, unbelievable. All yeah, you, you have too much wit almost for other people. And the other day, he was he, he put a post. He goes, that crazy guy came. He didn't do that. He go, can I be the first one? Can you go to invite me to fight in the parking lot? I see what's the matter with you. I'm out of your mind. <laughs> and I oh. love Mark. Oh my God, I've met Mark. him too. He's oh. fucking huge. He's unbelievable. He's an unbelievable guy. We when I you. Japan, I went to a party. When I get there, he was already drunk, sleeping on the camp. <laughs> I go, motherfucker! I yeah. grab him, put him in the camp, take him home, take him to the hotel, put him in bed, and then I will go back. Yeah, he can. Oh, say, man, you too big for me to babysit you. Oh my God, yeah. your Japan stories yeah. are probably uh, insane. Him, Phil Baroni, all those guys. <laughs> Phil. Yeah. Phil's my cousin. Actually. Oh, he's so. the best. I love him. Ask him. Man, we get Phil on the show all the time. I got Phil in bed to sleep. <laughs> you, ah, why didn't get there? He sleep. I said, come on, buddy. Poof. And then I took him home. He took his night girlfriend home. I dropped both of them. I said, now please give, your, give the driver your address. and took his girlfriend, then I went home. Oh, my goodness. Then I went to the party, yeah. Now, ever, ever get many street fights or scuffles in Japan? No. When you were over there? You were just a hero over there. Like, yeah, they didn't. The people there. Yeah, it's a big difference. 
It's a different world. What is she for is the teacher very good. That's the one thing I love about competition in Japan versus the United States. Respect. Hey, hang on. Takedown happens. Oh, like goes nuts. And they have knowledge. No, no, no. no. The fight. Then, ten minutes or no, like thirty seconds on the ground. People in the United States start booing. In Japan, they sit there like they watch. You see, eighty-year-old ladies. When you do a right move, yes, pass his guard. Yeah. Do this. Get yeah. him out. I actually used to love that about Pride. Yeah. How the fights were almost yeah. silent until something yes. actually happened. Like you could, like, was completely silent. You, could, the, 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 your corner man could just speak normally. Like I'm talking to you right now, yeah. and you could listen. You could hear everything. Yeah. You know? yeah. And I'm now they got the like Ric Flair, woo! Yeah. yeah. Or just, the crowd's always going crazy. And then yeah, they. Yeah. They boo the grappling because they don't understand it. Because now you yes. see, I'm sure, when you watch fight, jiu-jitsu, yes. people don't do jiu-jitsu the way they yeah. used to. You know what I mean? No, now no, people no. try to avoid it. I was it. just talking to David Branch. I said, boy, you know why you're having tough fights and tough days? It's because you forgot your jiu-jitsu. Yeah, you know. unbelievable. So I used to always argue with people, too. You have to make people uncomfortable with your jiu-jitsu. Yeah. So you could do Muay Thai and you yeah. have the eight limbs. You Everything. Have, you have eight ways to end the fight. Yes. Elbow, kick. Do jiu-jitsu, you have... Every choice. I have a hundred ways to end this fight. Look, Seventy-five look ways to end this fight. Jose Aldo. Yeah. Jose Aldo was one of the best jiu-jitsu players ever. He beat Cobrinha in a world championship with the Gi. Mm-hmm. Cobrinha is one of the most award champions in jiu-jitsu. Yeah. Jose Aldo, when you saw Jose Aldo doing jiu-jitsu, though, fighting the ground? Never. You talking so about... That he hits, he hits people, people fall, he waits for them to get up. Yeah. Yeah. You, you know, see it a lot. You see a lot of guys. A lot, yeah, yeah, even yeah. like BJ Penn's last fight, he tried. You know, he wasn't trying to take Clay Guida yeah. down. Wasn't trying to pull guard. Yeah. Like your your jiu-jitsu is so high level. Just get it to the floor, that's and you will. That's that's almost like the old school like Brazilian way, right? It's like <laughs> like let's knuckle up, right? Because uh, lo- uh, yeah, this became a problem. That's why you don't yeah. see so many jiu-jitsu players like, today. Yeah, yeah. Marcus yeah. Gavao used to yeah. train with us, and I'd be like, "Yo, you have such good jiu-jitsu." Take him down. Yes. We've been working takedowns to, and do it there because he's just from the hip, big. I'm like, yeah. dude, what are you like? So they lose in that game, and when you see the fight becomes an odds. Yeah. You can win or you can lose. Look at yeah. Jacare yeah. against Chris. You right. can win or lose, and Chris right. is doing the same. Right. So it becomes a lottery. Yeah. In the like end, that's one thing that, like, I'm a wrestler, so I've always stuck to those roots of why yes. I'm always going to win there. So that's where I always go. You have hours to drive the fight where you're stronger. Yeah. You know, you can. And if I have trouble with that, okay, we're here. Also, I've heard you say it, though, too. Like, you'd rather strike with someone for 15 minutes than wrestle them for 15 minutes. It's exhausting, grappling. High-level grappling, too. Yes. Scrambles and yeah. getting out of submissions. And yeah. that might be also why they go away from it a little bit yeah, now in today's game. No, 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 only that. I mean, that's the way to get training. You go see the training, they are only training exactly like those fights we have seen. Yeah. So you end up having the results when you go in there. That's what you have. That's what you deliver. That's what you practice and everything. Yeah. So now I know you just came back, beat Yuki Kondo yes. last year. Mm-hmm. Are you done now? Was That was no, it, right? a couple more. Oh, you're going to go more, right? Yeah, hell yeah. Just well, to make fun of the rest of my family. I say, I want to see you guys fighting at 52. Oh, yeah. What, are we thinking one again? I'm going to fight one again, yeah. Oh, all right. You yeah, seem I have like... an invitation to fight in Brazil, too, so I'm going to see those two. Maybe two by the end of the year. Really? Yeah. You've been, so you've been training a little bit? No. No? No, but mentally, I'm sharp as a needle, so that would be easy. Which I is... put six months on training now. Yeah, yeah. mental's... Well, you know the sport. So much of it's mental. It's physical, but so yeah. so much more of it's Like, it's... What would you say? You know how people say 99, 1%, 90, 10, 50, 50? To be honest, what people don't realize... In, I only realize this now. It's how much strength and effort I wasted in my fights. Like, look at my last fight. I was laughing. They brought me the bench for me to sit. I said, Who brought this? Yeah. Are you calling me an old man? Take this shit out of here. That's what I told my brother. Yeah. And the doctor that came with me is a friend of ours, black belt from Brazil. He goes, I'm not touching that bench anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so we're joking back and forward. And the ref was like, You know, you guys got to fight. I said, Look. I said to the ref, you know you have, why you have this job? It was because I did my work in the past. So let me explain to you so you can learn. First round, I'm studying him. Second round, I'm going to finish him quick. And you won't have nothing to complain. Watch and learn, I said to the ref. <laughs> That's exactly my words. I go in, I finish you, Kondo. I'm in the locker room. I just get to the locker room. The ref comes over and goes, here's I want to apologize. 
and can I ask to get a picture with you? And thank you for giving me my job. Oh, well, he probably come over like, sir, I wanted to apologize. <laughs> Forget everything I said earlier. Yeah, because he became a new, a new, like, I go through fights and they act like I don't know what's going on. Or yeah. I, and they make the rules now, you can't. Oh, right so now, also sat down on the ring. What's horrible to you? They didn't want to let me step on the when oh, right also fought the last fight. Horian's and, your cousin, right? Yes. My so cousin. your cousin started the UFC. Your family started this shit. I was we fighting this in Brazil before this. Before. Yeah. But I, I, I go to Horian's fight. Why? Why Nelson? Right. I go to his fight with Roca, but he has his corner, so I stay back a little. When the fight is over, I want to go by behind the cage. You cannot go in. You're ready. I say, why not? There's two people in there that you guys allow. I'm the third. Can I be outside here? Talking to him, congratulating him for his fight. And I goes, no. I say, this is the rules. I say, who made those rules? He goes, the commission made those rules. What the fuck is wrong with you guys? For the sick. That's what you're talking to me about it? And then the guy froze and said, don't think. I'll beat the shit out of you right here. I said to him. I said, believe. Sometimes those commissions, right? They get like little Please, bit like. You have to understand. You, you, and you yes, stop. Yes. Like, yes. Shut up. Don't talk to me like, like this. I'm not going to rob you know, anybody. You know the funny thing? When they have a boxing match, they shut the fuck up and they sit back and they do whatever the hell they want. And when the, when the MMA comes, they act their way. Because why? We are educated people. Yeah. Yeah. That's the big difference. On boxing, it goes. The craziest are there. So they don't, they don't want a problem. It's like the police officers who don't pull over the, the real bad guys. But they see you driving a Mercedes, well, you they get come over, they give an attitude. It's exactly the same thing, you know? Yeah. So it's, this is the reality. So I see them doing that to MMA all the time. And the problem, the people from MMA don't impose what should be done. You know, they don't, no, this, this is not a rule. The guy goes to celebrate, jumps in the cage. They go, get out, get out, get out. Oh, yeah. The celebration is the most important part. That picture that you see on the wall there when I fought Pat Miller pitch, I had 30 people in the whole arena with me. When the fight was over, they all jumped in the ring and they lift me up. They want to kick the guys out. I said, leave it. Yeah. Don't touch them, leave it. So we celebrate, we have those amazing pictures. The following events, the owner of the event comes to me and says, do you think we could have them jumping in and lifting the fight up? My man, this is history. This is the yeah. picture that your grandkids are going to be seeing. In and today's you world, yeah. You jump in you do this, the guy, get out of there now. It's an ignorant guy who didn't belong. His sport probably was, was uh, fishing. Fishing or, or, or the other one that they threw the ball with the net. Lacrosse. Oh, lacrosse. Oh, yeah, 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 you know, yeah. with the girls play too, right? Yeah. Oh, you know, <laughs> this. Oh, man. It's, you know, so it, we had enough. So they, they come from this and they want to impose this on you. Yeah. You can what are you afraid of? This that, that he fell from the cage? Right. He's gonna yeah. bounce, yeah. my friend. Yeah. Yeah. They just got to a fist fight. Yeah. But the one tried to kill the other. One tried to kill the other and then oh you're gonna fall, you're gonna hurt yourself. Well like the UFC uses that stuff as marketing. You know, like when Justin when Justin Gaethje does a backflip off the cage, they're That's not like, they put it. The commission though is like, bro, don't do that, we'll find you, blah blah blah. They can't find him. They okay. find you all the time, they try to, I'm going to take your money with me. So yeah. now, we oh, just, or, 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 they go, okay or they go, or you apologize, and we give you a break, so you have to apologize. Name a jump on the cage, they're going to take him, I think, $1,500 from him from his fight. Oh, really? Because he jumped in the cage to take a picture, celebrate. And, or you apologize. Yeah. I go to him, before. to be honest, if it was me, I'll tell them, fuck it. <laughs> what? <laughs> if you want your $1,500, I got it. So I, that's why, I, hang on, I was always nervous, like, what if I fuck up and look like an idiot? My brother, you can't look like an idiot. Uh, you know? I always you think. Uh, you're expressing yourself, you're happy with yeah. your achievement, what you did. Well, the thing all is, the years of hard work you had. Yeah. And then they want to shut, you finish. You know what it is, though, too? The commissioners, the people that are doing it, they never fought. So they, they don't know what you're experiencing. They never were fans of this sport. They just yeah. came in. Yeah. And now they, they, they need to judge. Your Nobody ultimate high, your ultimate moment, moment, they're like, hey, man, get out there. Stop. Stop doing, stop doing what you're doing. This happened a lot. He needs more expression. It happens a lot. Yeah. That's, That's why I was just saying, I wonder if the UFC pays for that. 
Like if Justin Gaethje does a backflip or someone climbs up there. No, no, they, can come, they come and they take your purse. They take a piece of your purse. The, the commission yeah. probably takes it. And I don't name them. I say, them, I would give you $1,500 for you not to apologize. <laughs> but he went and they apologized and got his money back. For me, like winning was like, that's how it was supposed to go. So when I win, yeah, it felt great. But it wasn't like, like when I would lose, though, the fucking planet. Yes. Fucking and You go cry in the bathroom hidden from everybody yeah, else. No, yeah, no. I Yeah. Like, it's a different level. Yeah. But when like, like yeah, dope, get some drinks, but like lose, I'm like Well like, you know that conversation. This is the most brutal sport. So basketball, football, baseball, I'll be out next season, I'm gonna play tomorrow. MMA, it's like, oh man, I gotta live with this loss for months now, you know? Yeah. Yeah. What's up, man? How are you? It's one of those sports. Like it's definitely very mentally taxing. What we got right here? This is the monster. How you doing, Stan? Nice to meet you. A lot of the guys training here at Henzo's now. I think they were giving out some belt promotions before too. Oh yeah. If you heard those claps. Are you teaching anymore? What do you teach? Yeah, I taught yesterday. And I'm gonna probably teach tonight. I have a meeting at two fifteen, and then I come back. I have a 2.15, 4 o'clock, and then here. Yeah, this place is huge. I've never yeah, been here. Yeah. So. It's 18 classes a day. Yeah, three floors. Yeah, we have 18 wow. classes a day. On top of pros doing their own training yes. here. Or yeah, they, in the middle, we have the intervals. They go and do the training. Yeah, yeah. but I'd imagine, too, they jump in the classes a lot, oh, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. How many guys at the top professional level, whether it's one, Bellator, or UFC, are, are coming through Henzo's? That's crazy. One time, one training session, I count nine guys from the UFC. Yeah, one train. Station. I think I've been in here for that one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's me, Frankie Yeager, I think George St. Pierre, Chris Greg Weidman, Gillespie, was, yeah, yeah, Chris yeah. Weidman. Well, um, Weidman. Fuck, we just saw him. I'm drawing a blank. Dave Branch. Dave Branch. Dave Branch. And I'm sure a lot. Yeah, there's a, a couple of other pros that you're just forgetting right now. Yeah, and my boy McDonald used to come here all the time. Now he's, now he's fighting him. Uh, he training him with us a lot. Yeah. yeah. And, and even George, George still works with, with John, John, right? Yeah, yeah. So a little... Is that a little bit of... Nah, nah you guys have been doing this forever. Fighting is a must. Yeah. So better. I don't sharp side, my friend. So it's better that he's a good guy, that I know he's fighting a good guy, and he's testing himself. You know, he's going to be a much better man after this fight, winning or losing. That's the truth. You know? And once you fight someone, I think, especially at the professional level, I'm right up there, yeah. you guys, I'm sure like you have that weird bond. Like if you two saw each other at a bar, what would be like? The best friends you know? I had in my life, I beat them up in the street. In the street <laughs> yeah. Then we had the friends. The best of them, yeah. 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 You beat them up, then I'm like, hey, man, yeah. maybe we, sir, maybe we, maybe we can hang out. I want to start doing some jiu-jitsu yeah, with you. Yeah, you should do some jiu-jitsu. Like, come on, take you there. Oh, there was my God, one time though. I come home, my brother Half is outside with my fighting shorts. I look ahead and say, Half, this, this shorts is not to go to the beach, it's just when we fight. And he goes, I know, that's why I'm wearing it. I go, what's the problem? <laughs> he goes, I had an argument. The guy wants to drop his dog, he's coming back. <laughs> I go, really? He says he's coming back and you're waiting outside like this. And if he comes with a gun, no, he's, he's gonna be bad enough, he's gonna come to fight. He's bigger than me, he thinks he's gonna beat me up. So what I did, I go inside, I grab a rifle that I had, and put it right next to the mic. When the violin from the top, I put it right next to This is in Brazil. This is in Brazil. I have a rifle loaded right there. So if the guy comes with a gun, I'll shoot him. Check me. Yes. <laughs> You know? So I'm sitting there waiting, then I see the guy walking with an attitude throughout the plaza that we had right in front of our house. And look, look, he pulled the shirt off, shorts, no gun, nothing, and he's coming. So I say, okay, let me go down to save him, right? So I went down again, outside, they go right at it, they get the fight, half hits him two times, he walk, half takes him down, mounts, when half goes to hit him, I hold half's hand, half, no, please, please! <laughs> One good one. I said, no, 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 Half. That's enough. I said, come on, chair. I, I lift him up. I say, come, hit the shower in my house. This is my mom's yeah, house. Yeah. I say, hit the shower. We're making a barbecue here. You are a guest. I don't know. The guy's a little suspicious. He goes, I'm not understanding. I come here for a fight. Now you invite me for a barbecue yeah. and tell me to take a shower before we eat. Oh, I never seen this in my life. I said, man, you're not in a house of normal people. Believe me. What? What was like growing up like with your brother? Ah, you was have, like, were you guys trying to kill each other all the time? We, we, we had. We How many brothers? We were. I have uh, twelve brothers and sisters, Oof. but we grew up in a house with Daniel and the, the other cousins. All the cousins. So were we there. all together. So in reality, we were 
12 kids in a house plus the employee's kids. And we all train jiu-jitsu, we all, we had an argument, we go right there outside, uh, my uncle will be the judge and the fight will break right on the grass, you know, until it's time to split them. I'll tell you what, man, that would, because I mean, I'm one of three brothers and like, we had an argument, like we would fist fight and stuff like that, you know, but my older brother was a lot, he's five years older than me, so like, I earned at a young age, like, I can't beat him. And then I was like, with, through wrestling, like, I'll beat you up. He's like, yeah, right, not that gay wrestling shit, you know? Like, we, just, we never did it, you know? But uh, even when I started fighting, it's that old, like, he's like, yeah. I can still beat you up. Because like, they, they have a moral, by being the older brother, they have a moral on them that they believe they can beat yeah. you up for the whole life. Yeah. yeah, and like, he pushed me, and I had smacked him and got my hand back to my body before he brought his hands back from actually pushing me. So I went, bang, he was like, you're pretty quick now. And then, yeah, my dad was like, oh, shit. Oh, sh you know. He's uh, changed. Yeah, so I mean, like, because I've got two boys, and I let them, like, wrestle, and my younger brother will come up and be like, Bryson, I'm like, be a big brother. Go, you know. But I'm going to get my oldest one in jiu-jitsu. My brothers were lucky because I was the older one. Yeah. My father married three times, four, four, and four kids, 12. I was the fir first one of the second marriage. So I was older than them. And I took care of them. Yeah. Well, so even though I beat them up, I beat them up with love. Right. Even yeah. what you were doing in Brazil, you definitely have like a big brother, take yes, care of people yes, yes, yes. mentality yes. or like way of thinking. Yeah. Absolutely. And we and were raised in a very different way. Like, you know, you fight and then become friends. You don't yeah, care. that's fight not. was part of that. No, that's what I was going to say too. Like, a bunch of Lebanese crazy art. In the Bermuda's household, maybe you knew how to wrestle, your brother maybe knew how to street fight. The Gracie household, it's like, no, we're both really good. Like, probably, yeah. you know, like, you know the, the best, pound before the they fight. The best was when the fight was over, they would sit down and say what each one did wrong. Right? Yeah. You couldn't make this better by doing this. You couldn't make... So every experience, even in a house, was a, was a class. Was yeah, yeah, like, like your fighting record, record yeah. isn't your real record. I'm yeah. sure you got <laughs> hundreds of fights. And you'd be like, oh, I fought my brother 50 times. Yeah. yeah, but when you guys get in arguments, was it like... Strictly a jiu-jitsu match or like, was it like combat jiu -jitsu? No, like uh, we avoid to hit close fist. Half was dangerous. Half open. Could, open hand, yeah. Half was dangerous because half, there was no halfway. So I would surprise him, so I don't have to, I didn't have to hit him. You know, I would take him down quick and then play on top and he would go crazy, crazy. You know, I couldn't turn my back to him for like a week. So, so now how good was Hickson? Unbelievable. Everyone always says he was, he, was he, he was the best, right? He was, the, best, he was yeah. like the. He was the first Gracie that was actually athletic. He was heavy. He was like around 180. He was 180. bigger than all you guys. Yeah. Everybody else, I was when I was already 23 years old. I was 143. Yeah. Hickson was on that time like 182, and he was very athletic, very well tra trained, training, trained, you know. So he could he would do a session of two hours rolling. He would finish out the black belts in a two hours rolling. Yeah. You know? I've always heard the story, so I figured yeah. I'd ask a Gracie yes, first-hand knowledge true. now. Yeah. Yeah. And now, were they around when you were growing up, too? Like, the families oh, yeah. were super I close, right? Yeah, all the time. All What's the, the time. age difference between, like, you and, say, Hoist? I believe, no, Hoist, the age difference between me and Hoist, how, how much you think? He's older, maybe, I would think. Uh, but how long? How much you think? Three, four years? How much you think? <laughs> like, when I look at him... You don't age. Ten. <laughs> yeah, you don't age. The so. other day, the guy goes, Hazel! I watch all your fighters fight. I said, shit, when did you see my fighters fight? He goes, I saw them all. <laughs> I said, I never see my fighters fight. I have only pictures. I said, when did you see this? Give me. Give I me need to see this. <laughs> your father hoist. <laughs> I go, you crazy. We have the same age. Me and him. They're both 52. Really? Same age. Yeah. Same age. Yeah. And people come to me, your uncle, your father. I say, I say hoist. And one time it happened in Bellator in front of him. The guy, man, I just saw your father. I said, wait, wait, wait. What's my father's name? I knew it. <laughs> Hoist, go. How much did you pay him to say that? I filmed it. I, I have your tape. Oh, my God. Though. Like, I was telling Dennis, I watched, like, last night. I was just obviously pre-gaming a little bit. I watched a little bit of Legacy. I watched a couple of fights. You don't age. It's you age like... Yeah. like yeah. Yeah. I have a... The, Good skin. A, a guy came here this week, one of my shooters. He brought me a picture from 20 years ago, me and him. And him now I didn't recognize him because he used to train me 20 years ago and now he came back so when I look I said shit I, I, I he goes Hazel you are the same for 20 years from now 
and he goes, but I change a lot. And then I look at him, it's like yeah. a different person. Uh, yeah. Hopefully, you look, hopefully yeah. it happens to me. Not you, yeah. you're fucked. No, I'm aging. Yeah. I don't have yeah. gray hair. My son is 23 has gray hair. Wow. Really? Yeah, I don't have. I so don't how, have. how many kids did Henzo wind up having? I have three kids, two problems, one solution. Two girls, one boy, and uh, one grandkid. One grandkid. One grandson that is unbelievable. And I'm trying to negotiate with my daughters to have more kids, quick. I offered them a new car. You love the grandkid. Wow. You love the, you want more grandkids. I want kids running the house. I see the kid running. He rides his bicycle inside the house. Yeah. My wife, he's gonna, he's gonna scratch the wall. I said, oh, leave it. Yeah. But that's now, why, yeah. Did they train jujitsu growing up? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Both, all three of them? No, no, the girls don't. The girls don't manage the academy. Two of them are here right now. They're running, they running out the whole academy. That's why they move the office upstairs. They change the whole organization. They were able to increase the income of the academy a lot. And she did fashion, so now she's going to start working. She did fashion here in New York, so she's going to start working on developing the whole clothes line different. We're going to do oh, there you go. And the affiliation schools that we have 67 now, we plan to expand to a 67? lot. 67? 67 Oof. right now. I want to expand too much more, you know? Because because the the voice kid in had to he he doesn't have any academies. Does no, he doesn't. You don't have one in California? No. No, not yet. I got offered this week to open a big one. Oh no, you don't have an academy. No, in California. not yet. Voice does though. Voice doesn't. He doesn't. No, he doesn't. Oh, I thought he did. He does seminars. Voice does seminars. He lives off this. He Who has like it? To, to Caesar is in California. Caesar has Charles. My brother has a very has like three or four very successful schools up in. In San Francisco, what, Alfie has one in San Francisco. What's the big one in, in <coughs> California? That big chain? Um, Ted uh, Planet? Uh, no, Florida boy. Gracie Barra? Yeah. Gracie Barra, that's my uncle Carlinhos. Okay. But that is different, that he gives just the affiliation. They have 300 of those mm-hmm. right, all over the world, you know? But they give affiliation sometimes guys that don't come from them. All my guys came from here, came God. from our academy. Yeah. From this one. From this one, yeah. Wow. And now in Mexico, I, we have 30, 37 in Mexico. Okay. 30, 30, no, I'm sorry, 35. Because, I mean, Mexico. you're putting your name on it, so it's like, yep, this yes. guy can do it. Like, you have the stamp. I've yes. watched you train. Yes. Not, hey, yes. Henzo, can I buy yeah, your... No, like, no, there's no, 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 nothing for sale here. Yeah, no what affiliation we do, program. It's like, like Ecuador. The guy from Ecuador came. He's been training with us for every year. And now he opened the Henzo Grace Academy in Ecuador. And the things there are different. So they come to me, oh, but affiliation, how do I? I say, you're going to pay as much as you're comfortable with and as much as is good for you. They won't bother you. You sound like a good and boss. Oh, oh. Good yeah, he, was a, he was surprised. He got his, his belt yesterday. He gave him a certificate. You know, but then we are the man. This is a, it's like a family. It's a family. It's like people before, they want me to lock people in contract and don't let them get out. They have to fulfill, pay for the whole year when they not train. Sometimes life hits you. you. You you don't have the money to pay. You have to move. You have problems that I don't know about it. And if you, I'm your brother on the mat and I'm not your brother here, something's wrong. This academy, I don't lock nobody in contract. I just make the auto pay. It's going to be an electronic trust fund from your account. Until you cancel it. Until you come in here and you say, look, I want to freeze. I don't ask questions. It's frozen. I want to cancel. You can cancel immediately. Yeah, you want to keep the relationships good. Your aura, yeah. well, your energy. Also, it's, it's, yeah. he's got a. He believes in his product. He believes in. You know what I mean? It's kind of like you know, even if you're a well, relationship even, with a girl, like yes. you don't want to be with me, like. And I'm your friend before anything else. And even yeah. we're talking to a guy who his brother beat someone up and he took him in for a barbecue. So I'm sure, yeah, you're not turning people away. You know? Yeah, you love people. Yeah. That's like I said in the beginning of the interview. One of the things I love about you is how personable you are. Like you're like, yeah. like almost like. How do I word it? Like yesterday, yesterday I came here to the academy, and before I was able to get to walk in, I start talking to a lot of people in the street. So then I help someone that his bike fell. Then I and I'm doing everything there, joking, laughing, hugging everybody, talking to the mailman. You know, the mailman. I always want to shake hand like this. I hug him on purpose. He doesn't like it. <laughs> yeah, like you know, almost like you look know, like Dana White or and, other people you might not I, want to talk. I'm doing this outside, and then this guy looks at me and goes, "Hey man, can you give me a hand here?" He, he was holding a huge uh, package. I said, yeah, of course. I looked at the hole and said, I cannot, I, the, the zipper broke. I look, I said, man, you won't be able to fix it. See, one second, pull this out. Give me here. I walk over to the corner. There's a guy there that fixes. Zippers? Uh, leather and things. I said, man, fix this for me, please. Can you put this back? And it took the guy like 15 minutes. He changed the zipper. I brought back. It cost me 50 bucks, by the way. I come back. I go straight to the guy. I put it. The guy goes, 
I'm in law. I've been here for half an hour. I saw you talking to everybody. Everybody comes to hug you. People kiss you. It's so guys, one Brazilian guy was passing by. Hazel, you my growing up, you're my God. Please let me give you a kiss. Give me a kiss. Like I never seen this in my life. I said, well, what do you do? I said, I own this gym here. I show people how to hurt each other. Yeah. yeah I said, I own this gym, you know, and then he goes, You are different. And then when I finish fixing his thing, and I go, be careful because if you don't open this proper every time it's gonna break, he goes, You help everybody. I have he just opened a huge uh, real estate company here. He goes, if I can do anything for you, I won't charge you. He said to me. Because I'm impressed how beautiful you are. And I go, oh. I said, that was me being me. Yeah, 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 yeah. Unbelievable. You know, like kindness always wins. I'm, I'm trying to help this guy. Yeah, with that, I'm you kind. Know? You know, I know, it's different. No, but like it's just like uh, like in terms of like people needing like uh, caffeine to like stay going. Like you just go off of like just. Uh, but I sleep for hours and half a night. No problem. Yeah, well, that's what I was almost going to say. You actually said a word I could use. You're almost like a god in the MMA community. Like, I've never heard a bad word. I've never seen people be like, oh, I don't want to meet Enzo. But if they want to talk bad about me, call me first. I know terrible things about myself. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, you got to get going here soon, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. I was, up to you guys. Uh, what, we got uh, another 10 minutes or so. It's a pleasure to be with you guys here. Uh, for Foss, or am I saying that right? Uh-huh. What's that mean? What? For the sea. Yeah, what's that mean? For the C is a, is a, is a funny thing. You have like a t-shirt you're, yes. you're pushing. It's like... the fuck it mindset. Fuck it. Why? When we, I was going to fight in Manila, we were at the airport. And everybody's calling me. My family, everybody. My phone doesn't stop ringing. You, you, you going to the fight now? I say, yeah, yeah. I'm in Hong Kong on my way to, to, to Manila. Hazel, you're going to have to fight like this. This guy's tough like this. You do this. You do that. Here's when you get there, you go for a run, you eat this, you don't. And the phone doesn't stop. Everybody's a professional telling you how to do it. Right, right, so right. you get to a point that I go, guys, guys, for the C, which is fuck it. Cut the shit. If you were 52 doing what I'm doing, you could tell me how it has to be done. Let me finish and I'll tell you how it has to be done. You know? So during this, I'm on the airport and I, I scream, the guy had the camera on. Filming. And I didn't see, he was filming hidden from me like this. And I go, look, look what I told him. And then he goes, what you say? For the sea. <laughs> and then two months later, he says, Hans, look at this video. Because there's so many things that we did that we forgot completely. So he look at the video, he says, shit. He goes, let's make a shirt. Let's make a shirt. It's gonna go viral, and we do all the proceeds to care. So we sold 7,500 shirts. Wow. We made almost $200,000 of profit. And every dime was for charity. Where, where can I actually people... Just, I, I just came from paying the school of a friend of mine, a police officer, to go to a private school. They couldn't afford the whole thing. Oh, wow. I just wrote a $16,000 check and I, I just gave them that. Where, where can people uh, buy... Fodacy. 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 You com. Fodacy.com. com. That's it. Yeah, it's yeah, easy. Yeah. 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 I got it. And it's funny because everywhere I go now. And they're for sale at the academy, right? They are for sale here too. Right. You can find it. But the funny thing, I went to Canada, everybody had a photo shirt there. Yeah. I've seen them before. Yeah, I, I didn't really believe they're all. Yeah, they, yeah I've seen watch them all the last see. I'm watching suddenly the guy come for to hug the other one before he walk in the ring. Right behind him, for the sea. I go, yes. Well, I mean, that's, that's such a mindset for fighting. Because sometimes yes, when I'll be, I'll be talking to fighters and they're getting ready to fight, I'm like, dude, at the end of the day, like, just fucking yeah, fight. Yeah. Like, the, you know, yes. just I was. I up. have a picture. One hour before, was one hour, one hour 15 minutes before my fight, I'm snoring. On yeah. the, on the, I lay down, I'm sleeping. My brother comes to wake me up. I go, it's time? He goes, no, it's an hour and 15 minutes for your fight. I go, why'd you wake me up? <laughs> what the fuck? Leave me alone, Papa. In my head, I'm full to see, Papa. It's not, it's not the time. Leave me alone, Papa. When is 15 minutes to wake me up? You need to warm up. I said, I'm already warm. I crossed half the globe. I've been sweating the whole day. Said, <laughs> and then, like, Fighting multiple times in one night. I did that one time. I fought. It's like a different. A yeah, yeah, yeah. It's different. Oh yeah. 
Well, I mean, do you go in with, uh, like, some kind of, like, uh, what you do? Plan? Yes, you always moderate, not to overdo it. And that's one thing that I was going to tell you before. It's like today I realize how much energy I spend on early fights because I used to put a fight, go, ah, yeah. uh, and then I end up wearing myself out. This last fight, I was having fun. Yeah. It was like I was rolling at the academy. If I go in the mat now, I can roll for an hour. So I say, why when I fight, I'm tired in a minute? Yeah. It's like the same as you sit in a bicycle and you enjoy, you can go from here to Miami. But you sit in a bike and you give everything you have, in two minutes you're going to be laying down thinking that you're having a heart attack. Yeah. That's exactly what happened a lot in a fight, you know? So once, I believe you only learn this when you're older. That's why I'm enjoying so much to fight now. I mean, now that I think about it now, you see like a lot of guys out in the, the, the cage kind of laughing and, yeah. and smiling. Those guys never get tired. They go forever. Yeah. They're they have fun. They don't they build up. Overdoing. Yeah. They learn to relax. So you have to break this barrier. And a lot of times it's, it's insecurity that makes you be that tense. Mm. Yeah. You know, and then you see unbelievable athletes tired on the first round, dead on the first round. Yeah. Because I've I've been re I've been you know getting ready for fights. I'm like, have fun. They're like, fuck it. Like, yeah. What do you mean have fun? I'm, like, I'm about to get into a fist. Like, what do you mean have fun? You know. But like, there has to, like, so I try to mind fuck myself before my fights. Like, you will die. like you don't care if you die or not. You know, <laughs> like that kind of shit. You know, you it's how you are, what you believe. Yeah. You know, if you're able to convince yourself what you gotta do and how you're gonna do it, you'll do it. I described my whole last fight. I show it on the hotel before I left to the fight. I said, I'm gonna do this, this, this to him, and I'm gonna finish him like this, well, even the takedown. Yeah. I show the takedown to them at the room, then I go there, did the there, takedown. Yeah. There's a video online of him yeah. showing the move. Brando Vera, that was Brando Vera. And then him hitting it actually yeah, yeah. in the fight. Yeah. The guy he showed it to. Yeah, no. I show it to the champion, the Brandon Vera. Yeah. yeah. So I show Brandon, you have to use this one because Brandon takes people down. He's a good wrestler. Yeah. And people get up. I said, when they try to get up, this is the hook. How you bring them down, and then you hold it. You have the choke. As I was showing him, the police came. And I got video. Right. And the, uh, they were filming. Uh, uh, Victor Quill, the, the CEO of uh, one, one championship, yeah. he was filming. And I didn't see. So the police arrive and they look. Oh no, it's Brandon Vera. It's okay. So, and then I show him the move and. They put it on. A year later, I go there and I do the move oh, in the that's same city. How you beat Yuki yeah, Kondo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The same exact way. What yeah. is like eight months later, eight, nine months later. I love that, actually. Yeah, that's yeah. like an old school Brazil, that leg lace. When yeah, you, yeah, so, yeah, 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 that's some old school Gracie moves right yeah. there. So, in, but in between fights, what would you do? Because I remember in between fights, I was like, do I like stretch? Well, for me, it was like, hey, I was like, what, do I, what am I up next? We'll let you know. I'm like, yeah. No. Yeah, you know. You have to go in five minutes, four minutes. Yeah. The, the thing is, I used to overdo it, like a crazy guy in the locker room to warm up. You don't need it. When you want to fight, you waste them. It's yes, you waste the energy. You do the warm up, stretch a little, get yourself going, lose your body, like you do in the academy. Don't change of what you do in the academy. Right. So they get there, they go crazy, they hurt themselves. They let the nerves yeah. get the best of them. Yeah. yeah. And then the adrenaline starts to yeah, all about that. Yep. Yeah. Happened to me when I fought before. Yeah? Yeah, I got I went too much up here. Where I should have yeah. just said Photosy and yeah, been Photosy. like, let's fuck it. I don't think about the fight that I'm doing until it's time to fight. Yeah. It's like in my head, I think about strategies before and things, but I don't think, oh, the fight is now. Oh, it's coming. Oh, oh my God. There's no, this doesn't exist. I laugh at this, you know? Yeah. So now, are you like coaching Neiman? Yes, yes. Uh, you work with him a lot. Yes. I'm sure you're excited for this yes. fight that he's got I coming up. You're going to be there? Yeah, of course. He's going. And it's a, I believe it's a, Name is in a situation that this fight is going to really tell his level. You know, because Rory has been tested. He's a very good fighter. So it's going to be a very good match for him to test himself. You know? And he's the champ yes. if he wins yes, this. Yes. So that's a big yeah. moment for the Gracies yeah, right now. Like yeah. modern MMA, yeah. one of you guys. It's always a great moment for a Gracie when another Gracie steps in. Yes. Even if he's on the uh, amateurs league. There's two of them on the card, right? Yes. My, my brother Hobson and my nephew. Neiman and Hobson. Yes. All right. All right. What do you got going on this weekend? I may have to. I have a charity event here for a girl, for Ashley. She has cancer, so if people want to come and help, it'll be a pleasure. Where, where, where the big seminar. Help out. It's going to be here at the Academy at noon. It's going to be me, John, 
uh, Juan Ryan, all the guys teaching. What is it, Saturday? Saturday, this Saturday. It's coming Saturday the 1st, you know, to raise money. And what's the, what's the fee for that? It's not a fee. You donate whatever you feel like. Okay. You know, you come in, you have a class with us, and you make a donation to her. And, and then probably on the same night, I'm having to, I'm having to Abu Dhabi. I'm, uh, I'm going there with a couple of diplomats for, from the Brazilian government because they want to straighten the relationship between the Emirates and Brazil. And I'm good friends with the Brazilian president, so I'm putting them together. And you didn't know? you give the Prince of Abu Dhabi his black belt or oh, something yeah, like that? Yeah, you train them as well, right? Yeah. Very tough guy. Today they have a beautiful school program. They teach jiu-jitsu schools, mandatory, like physical education, on school, on the military, and on the police force. And they cannot go up in rank if they don't get a belt. So they need to work on the jiu-jitsu to be from a sergeant to a lieutenant. They have 125,000 people doing jiu-jitsu in Abu Dhabi, in any way. Yeah. They just passed a law that's going to be from kindergarten to college. So they're going to have 200, Mandatory? Mandatory. It's going to have 250,000 people doing jiu-jitsu, which represents 25% of the population. You know? Is, is, is jiu-jitsu an Olympic sport? Yeah. No. Not yet. It was the first time on the Asian Games. They put it on Asian Games, but for sure soon, it will be a little bit soon. Yeah, I, I would yes. imagine that. Well, you got a, a super busy weekend. We were going to do some commentary on some fights this weekend. Uh -huh. I know you got some amateurs fighting on the card as well. The New York Fight Exchange right over in Queens. But... Yeah, but the problem I have to travel, I believe, if I don't leave Saturday night, I have to leave Sunday. Yeah. yeah well, I you got to go to Abu Dhabi. So yeah. I'm sure that flight is a day, right? 13 hours. Oh, not too bad. Not too not bad. bad. And now, so real quick before we let you get out of here, when should people put their kids in jiu-jitsu? What age? To be honest, like in the seven seconds shoot, you're taking them as early as three years, three years and a half. My grandson, when he was three years, I have tapes of him coming here. He couldn't do this class because he will be here at five. I don't have to be the kids here. And I just did the kids program here for the, for, for, for the, because the parents train with us. Mm -hmm. So I put a program for the kids. But the reality, they can begin at three years old, you know? And I used to see my grandson coming here, do the whole class from outside. He wouldn't go in the back, but he would do everything here. You know? Oh, he'd do the adult class, you're saying? Yeah. No, he'll do the, the, the kids' the class, class from, from outside. outside. Oh, yeah. all right. Because he was old enough to get inside. Oh. But it's a very interesting thing. I read a book about uh, this amazing uh, this amazing family who played chess and how their father trained them. By age, he began the first kid. He would get and go, look, now bro, uh, uh, dad's going to play with him. The other kids would go, I want to go to them. You cannot now because you're not old enough. So he would put the kid in the room and he played like a, like a soldier's play right. with the pieces of chess, right? Okay. And then he gets used to play, throwing marbles, putting the, 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 the pieces down, at the horse, right, and right, I, right. everything. Then when the age for the second kid to come in to play with the, with the pieces, this one begins to learn the move. Yeah. And then the third one couldn't get in. Had to wait. So once this one got familiarized with the pieces and play and love the pieces, he brought the third kid. The first kid is already beating grown ups. When that happened, when the third one comes in. Yeah. This guy made three kids world champion level chess player. Like they were considered the best in the world with wow. the big names. And that's how he did it. So the day that I saw my grandson working out outside here, he couldn't go in the room. I couldn't go in there, put him inside. But I said, no. I, I remember the book and I said, let him be outside a little because he's going to wish so much to be in there. And now I see him when he watched the UFC. He stops everything to watch the whole fight, especially when the fight hits up. And sometimes it's next to me, he goes like this. Look at the screen, you know? Yeah. And even uh, little does he know, what he's, what he's watching is like, yes. yeah, my family started this pretty much. It's unbelievable. It's insane. Yeah. He, but, doesn't, he speaks a half of English and Portuguese, and the house only speaks Portuguese, so he keeps it in Portuguese. And it's funny, but he loves so much fighting, you know? He, sometimes I'm sleeping, he comes over, jiu-jitsu, and jump, <laughs> Oh, well, that's even like, I remember, Belfort. Oh, my God. 
the best. best. Belfort is the one that's popping in my head, but I remember that was you too when they lifted you up. You guys were all screaming jujitsu. Yeah. And I remember as a kid seeing that and being like, why the fuck are they yelling jujitsu? Like, yell hooray or something, you know? But that was the way of life. Yeah. Yeah. Jujitsu was yeah. everything for Brazil. I would say jujitsu as a tool that made us much better and gave us a lot of opportunity, opened a lot of doors for us. Oh, yeah. Oh, so my God. We are thankful to jujitsu. Right? It's like people say, oh, the Gracies, they hide, like they hide knowledge or they hide. Oh, my dear friend, I share everything I have because I don't know Jiu Jitsu. Jiu -jitsu. We are guardians of this amazing art. We yeah. nothing but soldiers to drive this art forward and make it sure that my great 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 son will learn Jiu Jitsu too, you know? That's my dream. Oof. You know? And I do the same by passing to everybody else here. Well, Hensel, you've done an amazing job with Jiu Jitsu, everything your family has done. Me and Menace want to thank you. Uh, thank you, Paul. Thank you for joining us for this interview. Good to be here with you yeah. guys. Let's, ah. let's make this a regular thing. Please. I feel like we let's could do, do this it. every week, but we'll do it once a month. We'll maybe. do it. That'll once be a, a month pleasure. or something. It will be a pleasure, my brother. All right, so we'll let you get out of here. We don't want to hold you up. Uh, thank you. Gotta, thank you for, again Steve's, for joining us. Steve's going to step in for a second. Right now, let me show you something. And definitely let us know when you book that fight. I will. Oh, yeah. Let Menace come down. You can beat him up a little bit. It's a deal. Look at this. I'm going to show you one thing. Uh, 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 uh. Uh, 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 uh. Oh, that's, that's him watching the fights? In it, huh? Oh. There's a blink. This, he was three years old. Man, yeah, I you miyagi him. I try to you get my kids to like watch, watch like wrestling, like this is what your dad used to do. And they're like <laughs> Well even that chest thing, that's like Mr. Miyagi type oh, shit man. right there. So. Oh, man. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I'm gonna throw Steven on here. And uh let me well, even, yeah, maybe Steve, you just pop one for us. Steve, how did I spell your last name? Steve Maraboli. You got it? Yeah. I have to get some tips from you next time. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Henzo. Man, so we just spent a little time talking to living legend Henzo Gracie. Yeah. And now we're about to talk to... How do you pronounce it? Maraboli or Marabelli? Airdrop it. Yep. Got him. Is 
Is that what you do, Steve? Motivational speaking? I'm a behavioral doctor. Ooh, oh, I like that. I don't know what I'm Shh. famous for, but... Well, Steve, welcome to Menace and the Man. Thanks, man. Stan the Man here, Dennis the Menace Bermudez. So where'd you go to school? I started the community college of the Air Force. Uh, the right. Then State University, CW Post, NYU, John Hopkins. A little bit of everywhere, man. So yeah. I, I started wanting to... I was military police. I wanted to be Rambo. You know, I wanted to be John Rambo. Right, right, right. There's an interesting thing that happens when you fantasize about combat and that kind of stuff versus when you experience it. Yeah. So I stopped wanting to be police when I got out of the military. Um, but in spite of some really good offers, I mean, I'm a first generation American coming from immigrants. So the offers to be in the FBI and CIA were tremendous for my family that, yeah. that I would be considered. <clears throat> Uh, you can imagine their heartbreak when I was like, nah, no more of that for me. Uh, instead, I'm going to go to school, I'm going to start an organization that helps people. Uh, my mom busted out the, the, the Catholic ideals meal, uh, and, and, uh, but I, uh, you know, I went on and, and did that. So through schooling was, I wanted to be, I wanted to be that guy who was in the boardrooms with all the the millionaires and billionaires. I want to be that guy. So I put my head down and went, it was all about um, business, business, business. So I made it to those boardrooms, man. And you know what's really interesting about that? Millionaires and billionaires don't ask you how to make money. They want to know how to deal with the mindset issue. How do I deal with my marriage? How do I deal with my wife and this nonsense, how do I deal with my addictions, how do I deal with my kids, how do I deal with this kind of stuff. So I, after all that schooling, I said, should I, I should have went for psychology. So I went back for psychology. I needed to offer something that, that they had. So in psychology, I fell in love with behavioral science and then uh, and went on for a PhD in behavioral science where you learn, you spend a fortune learning from some of the smartest people on earth uh, that we're not really sure how it all works. Yeah. yeah, right? yeah. Like, that's, that's really... You know what, like, we, we really don't know. Could be different than my girlfriend, but he's, he's got know. the answer for both of us, you know? Which is why people in the physical sciences, medical doctors and stuff, they'll consider behavioral scientists, psychologists, they all consider it a pseudoscience because it, it's, it's not by science's rules it has to be reproducible. And it's not. Yeah. What I... I a stimulant to you, a dopamine, adrenaline to you might be something different to me. I used to jump out of airplanes with a machine gun. I'll fall asleep on, on a roller coaster. Right. I, I, I nothing it. I nothing a roller coaster. The person next to me might be screaming in terror. The person behind us might be, yeah, screaming in, with enthusiasm. Yeah. I'm flatlined. Nothing. So what does adrenaline do? It doesn't. It doesn't have an equal, repeatable thing. That's why you, when you see uh, these these medical uh, commercials where it says, "Hey, we're going to give you this pill," it's either going to make you better, or you might want to kill yourself. <laughs> like they don't. They're not sure because they're, it's not repeatable. It's going yeah. to. It's going to interact with everybody differently. Well, that's why probably. I mean, maybe I assume for a lot of psychological drugs, they give endless. Disclaimers like, yeah, this might make you want to commit we'll suicide. This might give you diarrhea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. your asshole is gonna fall out. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, it, it has all those. A lot of fine print. Fun. It's a or lot of fine print motor. because they don't know which is which. Or is you might have a heart attack, or you might die. You might have to get a needle stuck in that drains the blood. Like, yeah, they got the, some crazy. How shit. Viagra started? Yeah, that wasn't its original intent. Blood right? pressure medicine. It was blood pressure yeah. medicine, and they failed miserably. But noted that there was a side effect that was common. That could be and so duplicated. They, so they re repackaged it from yeah. blood pressure medicine to erectile dysfunction, and they created a whole industry based on their fuck up. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I imagine a billion dollar industry, too. Oh, multi, oh. multi billion multi -billion. dollar industry. Like, that's tremendous. And it started with old people, and then, you know, they did, you know, what we consider the boiling frog, man. They, they, they permeated into society where you could have. 30 somethings, 20 somethings taking it because now it's not it's not a dysfunction as much as it's as as John Jones says perform. it's the twist at the end of the punch. Right. You right, may not right. need it, but it's the twist at the end of the punch. <laughs> Brilliant. 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 I, I uh I forget what um 
comedian I was I was watching. I think it was Cat Williams. Like, you ever take Viagra, man? Like, I'm like, who who dick is this? This ain't my dick, you know? <laughs> Happy dying. Tell a doctor if it lasts. I'm fucking telling everybody if it lasts more than four, four hours. hours. Are you kidding me? Yeah. Oh, fucking amazing. That, that feeling. Uh, it's the twist at the end of the punch, man. So these enhancements become psychological enhancements. Yeah. So, so a, a, an issue that happens in in fighting where people get caught with with uh, uh, EPO, like Dillashaw just got caught. What's being left out is the psychological part. So, what's brilliant about the marketing of Viagra and those type of to, uh, products that if they are able to get somebody who doesn't necessarily need it to use it, and they recognize. You know, it is the twist at the end of the punch. They've created a psychological anchor where you're going to be dependent on that. And now when you date Sally uh, and you're like, oh, I really need a big performance today, even though you don't actually need it psychologically, you're going to need it. And they've now created a forever yeah. client. It's really Like, I've, I've never done it. I would hear people be like, do not have sex on Molly. I've never done Molly either. But, or like, uh... Yeah, right? Like, just because, like, it feels so good if you have sex after that, it won't feel good, you know what I mean? Right. And so be awful! I, well, especially someone like you, who we, we know something about you already, right? right. So you're in the 1% of the 1% of professional athletes that make it to, to the UFC, right? So we know that you don't half ass anything. Right. So you stay the fuck away from those kind of drugs. Yeah. Like, you, you can't try anything. Right. You're gonna you're gonna be homeless and well, I think, leaves in your hand. I think that's later. why I even know. got to this level is that I've never I've never I'm I'm totally like in like infatuated about the idea of drugs and why do people do it and how much does it cost and where do you get it from and, and how does it feel? He doesn't even smoke weed. But I don't I I've never done like I've never done drugs my whole life. Just because like I wanted to be the best, and I thought that would, you know, affect my performance. Well, it, it will. Yeah. It will affect your performance. So that's what drugs are. They affect the performance. Now, some people are looking for the affecting performance. Some people are looking to anesthetize whatever pain they're feeling. They are looking for some sort of effect in their life. So that's what they're looking for. If you're generally happy, if you're generally feeling good about yourself, yeah, it's going to create an anchor. That some, some people have and some people don't. As a professional athlete, you have to be super careful with that. Yeah. I don't, well, on the Molly thing, real quick. I don't think I've ever taken Molly. I've knowingly never taken Molly, but then my cousin George, we used to always go to the clubs in the city. He always fucks with me, and he's like, bro, I used to spike our bottles every time. Like, he used to drop Molly in the bottle. I'm like, Yo, are you serious? Like, yeah, maybe. Maybe. So I'm like, I don't know if I've ever taken it. Yeah, but that, so that does not, um, that would affect, like, your psychology. You because because I don't know I took it. So I would just yeah. feel great. And then he's like, you don't remember all those nights, how great you were, how great you felt? And I'm like, I thought I was having a great night. You know, I don't, he just, he just fucking with me, though, I hope. But yeah, so now there's this, like, second, like, I'm always like, double like, agent kind of bad Molly and Rufy. Yeah. Oh, I didn't roofie me, thank, yeah. thankfully. Yeah. I did notice that every time we go to that club, my ass hurts. <laughs> <laughs> that is the weirdest fucking club uh, ever. And then, so you, you have a son, right? I do. And then, have you, have you been married once, twice? I, I, I went. You're single? I, I'm single, um, and been single the majority of my adult life. Like, what? As, so, as like, a kid. Uh, you go through things, man. You make bad decisions. I don't often talk about it because there's people attached to it. But uh, but a lot of my writing and a lot of the things that that I'm famous for publicly, um, my writings and my reflections on life, come from a really really miserable time uh, where you get to you know I, I want to say it was Plato or Aristotle that said one of his one of his uh, dis uh, followers was going to go off and get married. And he said, go, go get married, man. That's a great idea. If you marry the right person, you're going to be happy for the rest of your life. Uh, if you marry the wrong one, you're going to become a philosopher. Wow. I, be I became a philosopher. Yeah. <laughs> a famous so I'm a philosopher one. now. A famous one. And so, uh, uh, yeah, you know, you, you look at life. It's kind of like jujitsu. So you, you guys catch me here as I'm leaving jujitsu. One of the things I love about jujitsu 
is that you could, for someone like me who's in a lower rank especially, you can be absolutely mauled for an hour from one horrible situation to another. But the philosophy that comes with that, and I was listening to you guys talk to Henzo, what's left out is that there is no gauge, there is no better gauge for how life actually works than a gym like this, for how life actually works than the profession that, that, that you're in. Because there are no shoulds or shouldn'ts. We learn here that the universe, life doesn't give a fuck what you think. Right, right. It doesn't give a fuck what you think or what you want. It only responds to behavior. It only responds to action. You know, Einstein said something really funny. Nothing happens until something moves. That was his description of the universe. Broke it down so simple. Nothing happens unless something moves. So you have outside of these doors, you have Endless people with endless thoughts, they got fucking vision boards, they got meditation practices, they got all that stuff. Great. Unless you move, unless you act upon what you want, you won't find out. And when acting upon this stuff, like I learned in, at a young age, you'll find out the bumps and bruises. You'll check, just like here, if you don't check your ego at the door outside, it's going to be checked on the mat. 100%, I don't care what belt you are, I don't care where you are in your professional life, your ego will be checked on the mat for sure. Just like when you're navigating that, or bad relationships, or anything else, you will find out so much about yourself. And when listening to Henzo, what you hear is self-acceptance and confidence. As a kid, I had neither. But when you go through grueling relationships, Dennis, I, I remember when, when uh, we talked to you about a grueling relationship you went through. When you go through these grueling relationships and you learn about yourself and you have the opportunity to either go up with it, go down with it, you'll probably do both. You'll probably do both. Uh, and at the end of the day, we learn, as Henzo said, hey, if you're going to talk shit about me, call me first because I have the best bad stories. I have everything. Myself, yeah. I have everything. You, you learn that, and I think that what came out of, of horrific relationships was the idea of, listen, we're always going to be a villain in someone's story. Right. Yes. We're I was telling Dennis earlier how most of my ex-girlfriends probably hate me or think I'm the piece and, of shit. And they'll, and they'll have that story, and they will pass a lie detector on, on what an asshole you are. Yeah. And, and that's... That's just how you go, and then you realize that through navigating relationships and businesses and that kind of stuff, that yeah, yeah, that, that comes out of that. So, out of the greatest messages come, come uh, the greatest uh, out of the greatest messages come out of the come the greatest messages. I think for me, it was early on. It was early on, and just a, a bad idea compounded with more bad decisions. Because like growing growing up like with my father and my brothers and some of that, and like even just. In school, like, I, I didn't, like, I don't think I hit, like, puberty until, like, ninth grade, you know? So I was, like, like the skinny guy, like, the small guy, like, 112 pounds, you know? But, like, I wanted the girls. Yeah. So, like, what could get me the girls? Like, performing at a high level or being strong in my head. So Standing up. So if I was the fastest kid, you know what I mean? Like, that would help me get girls and some of that you know so that was actually like a little bit of a drive for me also I was super competitive too but yeah. I guess I was competitive like for a girlfriend that but your life's gonna stay that way so whether yeah. you realize it or not then oh, it's no, you're, that's you're what gonna I'm be saying. that guy always because then you went into wrestling and you went into rankings so this literally put a number next to your fucking right name. and you want the high the, the lowest possible number and then you go into one professional organization to another where they do the same and they'll put a title, you're either champion or you're not. And then you go into the UFC and now numbers really don't mean anything, but they do, we're not sure, it depends, and it's all this shit. So you're, you're still gonna be in that zone. Yeah. You're gonna, a lot of your mental uh, stress, to, just as far as action is gonna go, is gonna be navigating the thoughts that come with combat. That's why you were asking Henzo about how he thinks, what's it, what, what his viewpoint is. Because most of your stuff is going to be, how do I best my mind for this event? Because you're confident in your skills. 
Yes. Because you put that time in there. Yeah. So you're you're gonna like how how does the best version of me come to this? And that's yeah. gonna be your 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 greatest struggle because it has been since you were a kid. Yeah. It's so always I, gonna be that. And then you know sometimes when someone like breaks up with someone, right? They had everything they do is with that other person, right? So you're like, I don't know what to do with myself, you know? So <laughs> like for me, one of my things is like one thing that I've always done by myself is work out. So I've been working. I work out <laughs> a lot. Well, they say it's hard to break a habit. And yeah, I think, yeah. I don't know, maybe you know, I know that they say something. Like, is there a certain time period when you form a habit? I think it's like 21 days it's, or it's something. It's a few weeks. It's definitely a few weeks. Um, it, it depends, again. It's, Everyone's it, different. It's, yeah. get, get Dennis to break his exercise habit. And see if it only takes a few weeks. You know what I mean? That there, there are people who do things and there are people who are things. That's who he is. Like, yeah. you're, not, you're not doing, you're not changing that. But, so. Well, I have this, it's a, it's a real... A real double-edged sword, cause like, something when I really think about it, like, cause when I work out, it's not like I work out so hard, it's like not enjoyable. <laughs> it's like painful and like, but it's like after I'm done, like I'm the man, you know, like yeah. look so, what you did. So it's, it's weird, cause I don't like before I don't want to work out, but afterwards I'm like I'm glad I did. So it's this weird well, battle. It's it's. It's a little secret about human behavior. So, humans only like two things: serotonin and dopamine. That's the only thing we like, and we'll and, and we'll build a whole life based on that. So, what he just said is, I'm a dopamine addict, and I know I get it when I complete a workout. Which what left out of that is if he skips that workout, he feels like shit. Yeah. So. And he'll talk to himself. Feels shit about. He always says like well, no, shit, feels like shit at, about himself. Well, no, I look in the mirror. I'm like, yo, you're. Yeah. So, you, one you're, of your phrases. You always say, I feel like a piece of shit this, today. This is this is why I get called psychic sometimes. It's really not. Life is magical, but it's not magic. It's what it is. So we can know that about him now. So he just he gave us a tell. He says I, I have a weird relationship with it. No, you're a dopamine addict, and so you get that from checking off that list because you're an athlete. That's where you're again. Think about from whenever you started wrestling or whatever sport you started first till now, you are 100% valued on your on your performance. Right. So of course that's how you value yourself. So when you are able to get that workout in, and it's a hard workout. Someone I want you to post if you guys don't follow Menace on Instagram. He posts incredible workouts. So when you do that, you say, hey, listen. I check. I feel great. And I'm the man because yeah. you got that hit. You, you and then what's the, what's the is it is it dopamine dopamine when you like or like dopamine well, is a cheat. Hey, when I got a text and it makes me feel good and it, it's when you get like likes and stuff like that. Those are those dopamine serotonin you're gonna get. It's more soothing when you walk along the beach and you're contemplative and you just you just Take a feel deep breath, good. Yeah. That's that's serotonin. Um, dopamine's the yeah. I got this shit done. When you, when you when you clear your inbox of emails, you, yeah, and you feel like you want to high five everyone you saw. That's dopamine. That's yeah. just that's the achievement, and that's you know that's how how I'll trick some of my uh, clients into achieving or changing behavioral patterns. Um, just you know those little. Those little clicks yeah. along the way, like you get when you set the GPS in your car. Right. It tells you one thing along the way, you know how much closer you're getting, and, and those are all little dopamine hits. So I was talking to uh, the manager at my gym, my buddy Brian Michelino, he was saying, I forget what he was, was like, you know, every morning it's like one of his goals to make his bed because it's such an easy goal to accomplish. It takes you two minutes. And, and max and like bang and it just kind of triggers this getting Reaction shit done bad. all day make make a routine so we know the humans serotonin and dopamine right make a routine that benefits you right don't don't say oh it don't say monday on friday i plan to or i hope to have this done by friday that means you just left your next hit a fuck five days away and you're, no wonder you're gonna be fucking miserable all week. No, right. do that shit all. Make your bed. Set set routines that you feel good. Right. Feel good with little goals, small and achievable goals. What I tell a lot of people is like, don't like talk to yourself like, hey, I'm gonna do this. Like, fucking actually write it down. Take because it out. Because then, of then, then it's like, oh, it becomes very visual of what not just a thoughts. It becomes actually a thing. 
that is almost tangible because it's written down. Well, well, you take something out of what might be considered the ether, if you're a hipster, and you're able to show it to someone else. Right. It, it's it's. So we have minute. I, I, Did you say that thinking I was a hipster? No. <laughs> we're, both, we're both not hipsters. We don't know what that means. So four quick ones for your for your audience, right? Four quick things that you for for guaranteed success, right? Intent, vision, action, and clarity. Four pillars. So in twenty something years that I've been doing this, and I've been so fortunate to to work with three presidential administrations, governments all over the world, and the top companies in the world. Four pillars of success. Intent. What the fuck do you want? Most people are ninjas at telling you what they don't want. Right. I don't want to live paycheck to paycheck. I don't want to be stuck in a cubicle. Nobody, everybody who's, who's listening to this right now, close your eyes. Close your eyes for a second. That's who gives a fuck what you don't want. Nobody. <laughs> I close my eyes. Nobody <laughs> fucking gives a fuck. I was like, should I? So decide what you want. So specifically, I not don't say shit like I want to make uh, I want to make more money because you you make ten more dollars will you be happy? No. Specific. Let's set an achievable goal. Okay, that's intent. And being real with yourself. Well, that's where the beauty comes in with this because you can say I want to make a million dollars. Awesome. I'll start with that target. Then comes the visualization part. Is it real to you? So what we know is something interesting about human behavior is the human life itself. So. The reason why, while cognitive science is really, there's so much information, they're still at the genesis of understanding it. Most cognitive scientists are still arguing what consciousness is and shit like that, so they're gonna be fighting for a while. One of the theories is called the egocentric paradigm. And what that states is that 100% of your life happens in your head. 100% that nobody actually touches reality, everyone touches what I call their agreement with reality. Is the movie good? Is it bad? Is it hot out? Is it cold out? Is it beautiful weather? We can all agree and disagree and all be right. What, what Shakespeare said in Hamlet is nothing is good or bad, but thinking makes it so. Scientists call it the egocentric paradigm. It's interesting. So menace, they want to operate on your leg, right? Do, what do they do? Do they numb your leg? Do they, they don't do any of that shit. They actually put a little mask over your face and knock your ass out, and they turn off the person who would receive the pain. That's it. They don't numb a fucking thing. They just turn Dennis off for a little bit. They cut you up. You don't feel a shit because it's fucking gone. Then they turn you on. They're like, hey, you're going to want to take a couple of these, buddy. Press, right. the, press, press that little button. Yeah. Press that little button. You're, you're back. You're going to want a couple of these. So they actually turn you off. So interesting part about it. So visualization becomes, holy shit, this is real. Because your brain can't really tell the difference between whether you're doing it or not. Your body can. Your brain can't. So can we touch on that for That's us? why your brain paralyzes you in, well, in your sleep. That's why your brain does that. Because if you're thinking of running in the fucking woods, your brain paralyzes your body because they're like, this motherfucker's going to go running in the woods. I twitch a lot, yeah. for sure. Yeah. Well, I feel like I'm falling for People a second, twitch, I'll do... They'll twitch a lot when they go... I was going to be like, we twitch every Tuesday, Thursday. <laughs> what do you mean? Into, into sleep, sleep paralysis, people will do it a lot. Uh, sometimes they'll wake up while still in the paralysis and they'll be like, oh my God, I was... I felt like I couldn't move. That's that's not uncommon. Yeah, because your body actually, because it knows your your brain knows your body should be sleeping, so it actually just stops you from actually jumping off or the building like, or dreaming. Or like fucking hitting someone and be like, yeah, sure. sure. Or this is like slow, like. But the passages are the same. So you hear Olympic athletes and that kind of stuff say stuff like, hey, hey, congrats, you won this race. It's like, listen, I've ran this race in my mind a thousand times. It's just the first time you're seeing. It. Right. And so those neural passages are being built and, and that construction's done so when the event actually happens, they're better prepared. So that's visualization. So you have intent, you have vision, now take action. This is the important part. Action has two parts to it. The one that Dennis already talked about. Take that vision out of your head and put that shit on paper. Whether it's a shopping list or blueprints for a building, put it on paper. In a plan. In a plan. And a plan that I can see, that everyone can see, and that you can follow. That makes sense to you, that you can obtain a little... And like, then you unass the couch and move. You can have two people who want to be healthier and burn more calories. One of them could be standing there and they could have the Dalai Lama as their meditation coach. 
and Oprah as their vision board coach. The other one can have no coaches and do two push-ups, and they're fucking winning. That's how this universe works. Wherever we go after, wherever we'll be in the year 2200, 22,000 is where we were in fucking 1800. I don't fucking know. Neither does anybody else. I do sure as shit know I'm here now, and that's how this shit works. Right. Action. Put it, make a plan, and move. And now the clarity is really important because, which is the last pillar of clarity, it, it's looking at your list. And the funny thing is, folks, you already do this every single time you want to succeed. So if you want to go get groceries, right? What do you say? I'm just, I just want to get groceries. That, nobody does that. You say, I need eggs, I need what diapers, I need bread, whatever you need. It's real to you. You visualize real to you. And then what do you do? You make a list. You know what happens when you don't make a fucking list. I forgot this. Oh, this. No, no. You end up with a bag of fucking, a whole box of cheeses like I do. Right? So you make a list. You know this. And now what happens, man? Is you make the list. You know what you want. You have your list in your hand. What do you do? You set up a vision board. You start meditating. No. You get in your fucking car and you go to the right. store. And what do you, how do you maintain clarity at the store? You look at your list and here's the dopamine. Check. Got the bread. Got the peanut butter. Got the jelly. Ta-da. Success. Are you surprised you succeeded? No. Obviously I, I got it. Right. We do that shit to go to the store. But not for our lives. Do if I were to say, Dennis, come to my house. I live in Port Washington. You've been to Port Washington before. Come to my house. Uh, you'll say, ah, it's about an hour away from me. I'll just drive for an hour. No. You'll want a specific intent. What's your address? Right? And then you'll either have old school MapQuest or you'll put it in your GPS. MapQuest. You know, you'll have something. And then again, you're not going to pray and meditate. You're going to fucking move towards your destination. And along the way... You're going to maintain clarity because I'm over here. And if there's a detour or whatever else, it's going to adjust and you'll be able to maintain clarity and enjoy the ride. We do it for the most simple shit on earth, but we won't do it for our life goals. I think that's crazy. But I'll tell you, all the people you guys look up to, those people who are pioneers in business, those people who are billionaires, not millionaires, billionaires, follow this little system. 100%. Same, same, same as me. Stan, you got it now? I'm going to listen to the Intent, episode again. Intent, vision, and, uh, action, and clarity. Intent, vision, action, clarity. So billionaires. You know what a billion dollars is? Side note, everybody. A billion dollars. If you just had a billion dollars sitting in a room in $100 bills, no interest or anything, you could spend over $84,000 every day for 30 years. That's $1 billion. So people with a lot of billions of dollars follow this system. You should too. If it works for you going to the store, imagine what it'll do when you put it onto your life. Also, when you follow this system, you'll see if your goals are viable. So if you, if you say, hey, Steve, um, where do you live? I live, I'll tell you, I live in Vermont. All right, well, because I have a few hours. Can I come by? Sure, put it in your fucking GPS, see if you can come by. I'm like, no, actually that's not gonna work because it's further than I thought. Once you're able to put it into, into a system, you'll see that, oh, this isn't viable. If I wanna go there, I gotta go, like, this has to be a weekend trip. Right. Something like that. If you wanna drive, you say, you know, we're gonna drive to Chile, Argentina. Sounds amazing. Probably take about a month, awesome. You're gonna find out around Panama, holy shit, we can't drive there. River. Yeah, Early there's ocean. a whole fucking, we can't drive there. Had you planned it and plotted out, you would see, oh shit, we can't drive there. We're going to have to think of something else. Same with going to Alaska, all these things. So when you're able to take it out, like Dennis saying, out of your mind and putting on paper and set a plan to it, it actually checks the viability of your goals as well. And, and all those things, like we were talking to Hanzo earlier, well, like, so, you know, let's say being a fighter, like, if you start knocking off these checks and these dopamines are getting, like, that also builds your confidence or your confidence in whatever you're talking about or whatever you're doing because it makes sense to you and you're the one that, that's delivering. It takes the mystery out, brother. I, I am all for taking the mystery out of shit. I love that life's magical, but it's not magic. There is a reason. Now, people that can't get out of their own way, you know these, like, so, like, for example, like, I know, 
Like, my mother's actually one of the smartest people I know. But, I'm like, Mom, do this, and it's an excuse. Mom, do this, as an excuse. Mom, like, I'm not, like, it breaks me. Well, it's often going to be someone from outside of your, like, you're not going to be able to impact her like you think you can. Mm-hmm. So, quick science. Again, I'm Steve. You're Dennis. You're Stan. But we're actually just atoms and molecules in motion. Right. So we're subject to laws of physics. If I were to fall off this building, I die, right? Because we're subject to laws of physics, we're subject to law of inertia. An object in motion will stay in motion in the same speed and same direction unless influenced by an outside source. You're not an outside source. Got you. That's why parents come to me all the time and they're like, Steve, you changed our kids' lives. They listen to you. It's amazing. Thank you so much. I don't know that you said anything we haven't been saying their whole fucking lives, but thank you so much. No, I'm saying the same thing, but they just can't hear you. Not because they don't want to. They actually can't be influenced by you. Good news, your kids are close to you, but also, and growing up, that's why your parents, nobody's parents are like, hey man, be miserable your whole fucking life. No parents are like that, but then you hear Bon Jovi that's saying, you know, live your life. And you're like, dude, Bon Jovi says, live my life, I'm going to live my life. Your parents are like, what the fuck? We've been saying this shit the whole time. Why Bon Jovi? Because he's an outside source. It's science. That's crazy. Uh. Yeah. Well, I, yeah. I, again, it's like again, that's something I already know. But like he said, like yeah, yeah. you know, it's, it's, very it's, similar it's, in fighting too. I'm sure. Like there's certain people that when they give you their take, you're like, oh. Well, no. Okay. With with going off that, like I'm also I'm trying to be like the best dad ever, right? And like I want my kids to, I want them to be a way better athlete than I was, and I want to try and help them do it. But like. It's kind of one of those things like, hey, son, you should lift. Like, nah, you're an idiot, Dad. You have to find that balance, right? The, the preacher's daughter was the biggest hoe. Right. right? You, have to find, you have to find that, that balance. So you have to, to kind of edge them in that direction. So the good news is with your kids that they're literally you. Right. So they have that inclination, right? We, we, we know that they're, like, they're not going to be uh, seven feet tall Swedish people, like, we know what they are. They, they're lit- I look like my parents. I'm never slam dunking a basketball. I look like my so I. Well, I have these aspirations <laughs> for them. No, their, their mom's brother is six seven. So they have the inclination for so, it. So, so your job becomes, your job <laughs> becomes, vitamins, <laughs> support, broccoli, yeah, no, yeah, support, good habits, yeah, good habits, so yeah. that they have this predisposition. So what we are then, life is a game, of, you figured this out, I'm sure, I'm sure you have too. Life's a big game of fucking Plinko, man. Right? I don't know that game. Yeah, oh, know Plinko. Plinko from fucking uh, uh, Price is Right. It's like the, this, this... Uh, the wheel? No, it's... It, the wheel. The, it's like this hockey puck kind of thing that they slide down this board. And oh, and you don't know exactly hits, where it's going to go. It hits all Got these yes, different... Yes, it lands in the slots. Yeah, yeah, it lands in the slots. That, yes, yes, Life's yes, a yes. game of that, man. So... The job as a parent is really just to, you know what their predisposition is, for you to provide the best support so that you increase the chances of something good yeah. coming out of it. If you pressure it too much, it, if it's it's it's, 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 it's like I grab your head in wrestling. You right. Know. Right. 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 Why right. would it be so different psychologically? Huh? I think similar to like what Hensler said, you almost got to be Miyagi though. It wouldn't. If yeah. you're going to be the influencer, unless someone outside well, comes in and is like, they, hey, you guys going should to be, wrestle. They're going to behave. We're primates. So they're going to watch your behavior. They see dad exercising, they're going to exercise. They yeah. see dad and mom reading, they're going to read. They see dad and mom yelling like fucking lunatics, they're going to yell like fucking lunatics. They're going to do that because it's, it's mostly in the beginning, especially the first 10 years, let's say. Yeah. It's mostly them mirroring. They're prime. We're prime. Right. So it's mostly mirroring, and they're not listening to you because you're speaking to them with a with a, an adult mindset, and and they are just a couple of years out of shitting themselves. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. so like they, it's we we want to talk to them like that. You're best off. Your behavior is going to be the the greatest teacher. And then again, 
you know, don't give them, you know, McDonald's seven days a week and, and those type of things that... I give them pizza once a week. That helps them, that'll help the probability. Again, it's, it's the universe doesn't care what you want, what you want for your kids, what you want for... The universe doesn't care. It's going to respond to what you are. So does, do professional athletes, uh, do people who you want to be healthy, tall, and, and, and athletic, do they eat uh, fast food? seven days a week no so like you know this right and so those type of things what what does that look like what is what is a healthy strong empowered child look like Henzo was talking about watching his grandson just watching the class again that's it primates Henzo's like I learned to just let him out there let him watch because that's what he's gonna learn he's gonna learn his grandfather's Henzo fucking Gracie <laughs> And he's watching a bunch of kids do jujitsu. Right. White belt kids do jujitsu. His grandma is Henzo fucking Gracie. He probably has something in him going, I feel a little bit weird you know? about this. Like I should be doing this or something. Right. And, and so he has the inclination, but if Henzo were to demand it, the kid's going to play soccer. Right. You know what I mean? And that's just, that's just how that goes. So right. th that's, that's, we are not immune to that. So it's, it's crazy because people, you know, I was a wrestler before an MMA fighter. Do you want your kids to wrestle? I'm like, I don't wish that on anybody. <laughs> you know, like, I mean, hang on, my kids will learn a, a, a shit ton about themselves and be disciplined. I want to worry about like, it's a very emotional like. So, so that that's something for you to work on. Right. So for your kids to wrestle, they could go to wrestling, and, and well, what, and, what and I they can like they can be. On any level. Well, man. my answer, my answer is that is yeah. Oh, my kids want to wrestle. They can wrestle, but there's gonna come a day where I'm gonna ask them. You have a choice. Either we can have fun, or we can be good. Because those are two different things. Sure. Yeah. And, and having their dad's a professional athlete, and again, I can't stress enough. Now that I get to understand this a lot more, the the small percentage in which you find yourself like that that become elite in the UFC there's so many fighters for you to have reached that so to be in that small percentage um, they have that in them so they're, they're it's very not probable that they're going to be like oh I want to be a slacker that's, that's, well, that, that's going to be a problem there's, so, so they may engage in if hey let's go wrestling this one they may engage and say oh you know I want to beat that guy next time yeah. Music to your ears. Yeah. Well, I happen to know how. Yeah. And you know that that's how well, you end up that. Well, it brings me back full circle. Like, sorry, is like you know how like I'm in that I'm not the outside voice. Yeah. Well, that's that's why you you connect them yeah. in those places. Steve, tell him this exactly. Yeah, yeah. You connect them in that place. You connect them in that place. Right. And you, uh, you have them go. You you have them go. Uh, and train with people you trust, and and and, pro and wrestling programs and that kind of stuff you yeah. trust. They're not. They're, I I see the dads. Uh, you know, I'm a member of a few gyms. Um, I see some of the dads that that are crazy at, at their kids wrestling. Yeah. And, and more wrestling importantly, dads. I see the kids' body language. And it's I'm, it's not my place. Nobody fucking asked me. I'm working out, yeah. but I'm watching this. I'm saying, you know, I want to go over to the dad and be like, dude, you don't know the fucking damage you're doing. That kid, you don't know what's going to come of that kid, but you do know that wrestling builds character like yes, nothing yes, else. Yes. I did wrestling in uh, well, what was called junior high school at the time, and in high school, I was okay. But um, when I went to military basic training after that, it while like everyone was, was suffering, I was like, Pepe Le Pew was fucking hopping yeah, through it. Yeah. because. Yeah. Nothing they were gonna do was worse than what was happening in those wrestling rooms. Yeah, wrestling uh, practice. Was you know, bad. wrestling practice was was brutal. It was absolutely brutal. It's like here. It's like training here. I did yeah. comp class and then a private. That there's nothing. What what's what's a competition gonna do? Right. What's, a, what's a five minute round with like, someone? I remember do? like one of my captains that was older and then I did it when I became captain. And we're like, we're just gonna do push-ups for like 45 minutes. And the fact he's like. Crying like you can do it, you know. Like, well, Jeremy went down. I guess we're doing ten more. You know, just making yeah. up bullshit. Just the fucking. Like that's military was like that. Yeah, like, we're, we're gonna, we're gonna do, we're gonna do pull-ups until it's breakfast time, 
and then someone can't do them all. It's like, well, yeah. I guess there's no breakfast for us today. Uh, nine out of ten wrestling coaches like drill sergeants. Yeah. You know, yeah. like they run like, uh, you're doing, you're doing, you're doing. And I mean, that definitely is great for like mental. Like, pretty much get broken and then, like, look back at what you've done and, like, wow, I just did 300 push Well, you leave that room, and it's, it's, I was, I was speaking with Ray, oh, Ray Longo, the great Ray Longo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we were talking about how you, you're in that, you're in that room at Law MMA, and you're in there with professional athletes, monsters like you. Um, it's easy to lose sight of the fact that when you leave that place, how badass are you in, at right. Roosevelt Field Mall? Right. You know, like, right, right, like right, right. Ray's like, oh, I'm a little sore today. I'm a little, Ray's 60 years old. I'm a little sore today. I'm on the, yeah. So here you may feel a little old and sore, but leave out there and show me another 60 year old that's in the shape yeah. that Ray Long was in. You know what I mean? So you just find, you find that. Same for me at 44. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm getting mauled in these places, but. But in tournaments, I just got to be the best forty-four-year-old blue belt. Yeah, and I'm I'm annihilating. I guess I well, I, I think the circle I roll with, I roll with is because they are very real with me. You know what I mean? Like I don't want guys like, oh my god, Dennis, like you're such a beast, you're an animal. Like get away from me. Those will kill you faster than a bullet. Buddy. You know, like, yeah. I need people that are like, hey man, like. Yeah, you need people now, in your life that'll tell you the baby's ugly. Yeah, you yeah, don't need, don't yeah. need yes men. You never yeah. need yes men around you. Yeah, no, those will kill you, man. At least the bullet fucking tells you it's going to kill you. Those right. people are the worst. They hit you the right yeah. spot. Like, yeah. yeah, those people are the worst. And also you get that know, yeah. you know, where I'm weak and don't try to like, you know, a little... Yeah, sure. Don't fucking... Don't zing me. me. Yeah, bro. Well, you're in right, right, you're right, you're right, bad here. Don't fucking, you know, oh, your dad died? Like, yeah. you know... Hang on, and I have a couple friends like that. Too soon? Too like, soon, right, yeah. yeah, you motherfucker! Very you didn't soon. make him laugh! Yeah. <laughs> yes, too soon. Yeah. We're at the wake, dude. Give me, <laughs> give me a fucking minute. But it, it's, it's that thing, and it's, I, I have a story I tell. Um, but those same people? Hey, I need something? Look, this Back. is real, buddy. It's yeah. real. It's, uh, my brother, my brother is 24 years in Special Forces. My mom got sick. She was a year with cancer before she died. I took basically the year off to, to be with her. And in the hospital, I ate broccoli cheese soup every day. Again, magical but not magic. Turns out, when you eat broccoli cheese soup every day in a hospital, and you need to wear a suit again, Tough. suits shrink in the closet, yeah. right? So I put on this shirt, and like it's fucking tight, man. And like if, if it could speak, it would be like, Hurgh. like it would be that noise, man. <laughs> so I'm looking at this and I look at my brother and I swear to you all, this is the first time I've ever asked and the last time. But I say, hey man, does this shirt make me look fat? And my brother looks at me dead in the eyes. He's like, no, dude. The way you eat makes you look fat. <laughs> <laughs> you need people like that around yeah. you. Always, yeah. Always. Always uh, around you, man. Guys, this is awesome. Oh, we're about to go try on some suits that don't fit, actually. Oh, that's right. You ever go to SRG Fashions? No, sir. Well, we're going to bring you there one day. They're a nice suit place in Astoria. Like a... Almost like a speakeasy suit place, I feel like. Yeah. There are no signs or something. You walk up to just a door, knock on the door, and let you in. It's just suits. Nice Italian suits everywhere. And then, do, they, do they fit it to you? Yeah. Yeah, they yeah. do them all yeah, custom. Yeah, called there. Like the Taylor. Yeah, yeah. There. Yeah, so what are you doing Saturday? You got any plans? I will be in Tampa, Florida. Everyone's going LA. I'm in Tampa, Florida. I'm speaking uh, at the Florida Behavioral Health. I'm also the chief behaviorist of an addiction recovery program down there. Um, so I fly down occasionally just make sure they're all doing what they need to be doing. Um, so I'll be down there speaking to, well, to a bunch of doctors and stuff. We were going to invite you to some fights well, if you wanted to hang out with that. us. But uh, maybe next time. Uh, yeah. Definitely. Is there any Because I've been asked, can people watch the fights? Fight Night Live. Well, then they'll see me and you. Fight Night Live? Fight, that's what he posted it today. The guy Mark Frado posted it. Okay. You'll hear us, me and you, so tune oh, in. Oh, that's pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. Fight we'll Night Live. We'll that's give you a shout out. Yeah, they're a, bit, they're a pretty big company. They do a Is lot that, of shows. Are you, are you moving in that direction as well? I like to think of so. We, I talked to you uh, so about getting some motivational I, speaking, which is not. It's not um, easy. It's not something I can do on like my own kind it's, of time. That's not down easy. by myself. After this weekend, 
we have some medicine the men have some things that we're going to put on paper and try to make I a reality think, but yeah i think that having that plan of attack especially since it's not something that you've been doing for so long you could probably do a, a, a training camp by heart um but it, branching off into something else make a plan dude this is what i want this is what i need i need a press kit this is how i how many right. emails i gotta send to how many people every like i mean if you saw how our operation runs, yeah. uh, now we're in 40, I have programs in 40 countries, um, and it, our operation runs like that, man. It's a lot of lists, a lot of to-dos, and I have a lot of great uh, uh, team members that, that get this stuff done. Yeah. So and I if mean, it doesn't I, happen, if, if nothing happens, unless something moves. For yeah. sure. My first thing I did was just write down what I think I could talk about. My second thing is I'll probably just set up a fucking black room with a light and just talk about them and make like a three minute video, put on YouTube and see what happens, you know? Yeah, I think that that's right. I think that, that make sure you're standing there. No shit, there. no yeah. shit. People are like, oh my God, you help me. Then I help people. And well, something I would love to do with you too, because I've told you your shit's great when you talk to fighters, is I would love to take you talking to a fighter before they're about to fight. Right. Like you, that... Like the yeah, yeah. the thing you wrote, Chris Wade. Right. If you said that out loud to him and it was taped, I think every fighter would watch that and be like, "Yeah." What's his number? You want to hear what I told Chris Wade? Of course. Shout out to Chris Wade. I. Uh, and what, he, we might do some grappling shows so, in the future, so maybe we're gonna get Steve Marabelli on that. Uh, uh, yeah, definitely. I'm, I'm trying to do one uh, now. Uh, I won't. I, I won't call him out because I. I did oh, we the, love when people call each other out. Yeah, I, I did it the proper way, but uh, I reached out to uh, to another forty plus uh, year old blue belt uh, with notoriety, so uh, to do a celebrity kind of uh, jujitsu match on at like a, a kasai or something like that. Uh, and was it CM Punk? Uh, I will not call them out, but um, to have some sort of. Um, something for neither well, of us need the money so to give that to veterans or or some saint jude or whatever i don't, I don't whatever. that's a call out it's like hey man let's do something let's take our our names and and, and yeah 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 that was, but I, I, I reached out to them privately oh, uh, so I'm was, oh God, yeah, well no. not call them out but if you say who you want to and then they don't take it now they look like a, you know, yeah i don't want to be i don't want to be because i don't want it to be like um uh Vengeful or, or, or like, hey, yeah. I'm calling you out. I'm just saying, hey, I reached out to him and I said, hey, listen, let's do something um, great. We both have a lot of people who, who admire us and follow us. Uh, we're both uh, uh, 40 plus year old blue belts, and uh, we could we can get a lot of eyeballs and bring in a lot of money for a veterans charity or like a St. Jude or something like that. You ready for Chris Wade? Yeah, ready? I'm with it. So, what I was trying to do is get him like. Almost bloodthirsty, if you will. All right. <clears throat> Here we go again. Not our first rodeo. We've been at it for a minute, so let your experience show. You're a bad motherfucker, Chris Wade. You put in the work, and you've done all the right things. We can't say the same for our opponent, but we're prepared for the best. You can beat anybody in the world. You're a fucking New York State champion. This guy couldn't become a high school state champion now if he tried. Visualize your knuckles breaking his ocular socket. Picture his nose bursting with blood. More and more with each punch that lands flush on in the middle of his face. Because it's going to happen. So see it first in your head so when it happens we're prepared to feel no empathy. When you rip your knuckles through his rib cage and you feel the air leave his body, he's going to look at you as if you stabbed him. You will feel no remorse. But we're going to grin as we look to deliver more pain and, and leave this man lifeless on the canvas. We will experience emotion. We will experience no emotion or feelings tonight. You're an animal who's starving, who needs to eat. You're a machine programmed only to deliver pain. We will not get tired, but we're going to come out on fire, full fucking bore. This is your fucking house. Tonight, that's your stadium. Do what you do. Throw this motherfucker down. Big brother him and take what's yours. You got this. Awesome. Way more violent than I remembered it, but... That is awesome. Well, yeah. the whole yeah. thing is, is like, you want those images, those, like, sharp images of, like, really, like, that gets you yeah, going. Yeah, I remember, too, before the like, fight, hey, too. hey, punch him in the face. Like, no, like, where are you going to punch him? Like, you were like, Wade, really street yeah. fight. Uh, sir, uh, sir, uh, street fight. Intent. Detail. Detail. Street fight. And action. Yeah. 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 
I'm on something. No, you're on to something, brother. And if not, Hallmark. And even that, <laughs> that, Hallmark that almost that. didn't do him justice, too. Like, I've seen him in someone's ear right before they're about to go out, and I'm like, man, well, I want to I go fight a fan right yeah. now. Like, I want to go fight someone. Because I've seen people going like, like, and they're like, yeah, fuck him up. Like, they be like, no, dude, this is fucking your. Like, there's two different, like. Sure. Come on, man, like, go out there and do it. Yeah, or, you got, yeah, you got this. Or like. That's even, that's a shitty, that's such a, well, it's like, got, it's, it's like, like your mom says that. Your mom score. Yeah. Obviously, I'm going to, I'm yeah. trying to fucking score. Right. Right. I, I get that. No, that's good. I like, and I kept, again, I like the specific intent and visualization behind it. Yeah. That's. So what have we had you here for, an hour? Has it been that long, I man? think it has Dude, been. Dude, I don't shut the fuck uh, up. Oh, these you guys, in fairness to these guys, he goes like, hey, you guys, you want to talk for a minute? <laughs> Ask me a fucking question that I didn't shut up for an hour. Oh, we love that, though. Well, you're no, you're one of the most insightful people. Yeah, we go into, right on. This is what I do. I, I get yeah. paid to travel around the world and think out loud. And also, we I almost want to have that. that for our following. We want to talk about relationships and what our following and our potential people could do in their lives to better it. So, yeah, this is perfect. Hang on, you said it, and I was thinking, like, definitely listen back to this episode. Just 100%. Write, yeah. Writing down some things. Well, a lot of people. We had on Phil DeRue. We had on you. We had on... Who's the other one that we had on? That Algeri. Was, Algeri was really motivational. I feel like we had another yeah, he's good speaker now. on. I like Oh, uh, you're asked. Right? Uh, your ask, sermon, or like yeah. philosophers, if you yeah, will, yeah, and you're sure. definitely up there as far as. No, it's, no, he's. he's yeah, like, oh, you're the top. Yeah, he's, you're up there. Well, like <laughs> Jansen was who I was thinking. I of. think uh, he was yes. very philosophical, if you will. I think why I, I get I get to be in the cool rooms is because, um, you know, cool and, and no no disrespect <laughs> to to the 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 really famous motivational speakers. Um, to be quite honest, they're really famous at being famous. They're Tony really, Robbins, they're, they're, guy like that. I, yeah. I've been on the circuit for 20 plus years in all the greatest conferences with all the greatest biz, business leaders. I've never seen that motherfucker once. What I'm telling you is business is something that you have to go towards and not just be the rah-rah fucking goosebumps. That's emotional and intellectual masturbation. It makes you feel amazing, That's what but nothing's, yeah. nothing's fucking born of it. You keep needing it. Yeah. You end up being addicted to their shit. They're almost anyone, not trying to solve your problem. They just want you to buy their I don't their want anyone and, to be addicted yeah. to my shit. And here's the thing. I just want you to, to, to realize where you're, you're solid, realize where you're ridiculous, um, and make those adjustments. And to, to take that idea of, yes, it's magical, but it's not magic. There's a fucking formula to this. If you don't understand why you're ending up with seven and you're saying to yourself, but I'm doing this, what I hear is you're saying, I have two plus two and I have seven, I don't understand. And I just say, well, then you don't have two plus two. If you have seven, sure as fuck you don't have two plus two. Let's see what you're not seeing. Right. There's seven here. This doesn't matter. The laws of the universe weren't suspended for your shit. There's something you're not seeing. And so this is where this is why this is important. I think that's why I get the notoriety and get put into there because it isn't about goosebumps. And what I love what Henzo said, what he does with the Fodacy shirts, which I have worn at seminars. Um, I've Eight been one. a best-selling author for since 1999 for 20 years now. So where? Hold how on many a books do you have? Where can they get we them? We have four books, and books are in 35 languages all around the Jeez. world. And I have never even bought a slice of pizza with that money. We have empowered women's centers in Central South America. We have veterans programs all over the United States. We have uh, education systems all over the United States. 100% from those books. Wow, that's amazing. So, so in, in getting big paychecks, it's great. I give away most of that money, which is a really cool thing to do on planet Earth. Shitty thing to bring up on a first date. But a cool thing to bring up. Uh, to yeah, but hang on. Out. If she wants to be with you, because buddy, you can... I haven't. I have been. I, I like to say I've been on a thousand first dates. I haven't met any of those women. Once, once Google exists, uh, every single one of them is just interviewing for the position of. Uh, it's fucking horrible. They're probably fantastic. I've probably sat across from some fantastic fucking people, but they're. They went about they're it like wrong. I really love charity. No, you fucking don't. No, you don't. Just be you. Right. I'm, I know that my crazy is. Tell it. me you like Gucci. Uh, yeah. Right. I know that this is. You want is, me to buy you Gucci? I'm the crazy one. And you I need to meet that. a girl with a flip phone. It's like I just hate this whole internet thing. You know. <laughs> yeah. Don't know right. anything about well, it. Well, I've had it where I feel like I've earned it, 
like I've used my wit and charisma to, to earn like a talking. So online at the bank or, so, or at Starbucks or something, and I'm like, wow, that I've used my wit and charisma to actually engage with this chick. Well, and then, and then I tell them my name. I always say my name. It's nice to meet you. Next time I meet them, different fucking person. So charity. Let's talk about that. Yeah, then. it's yeah. different fucking person. Endlessly frustrating. But again, it's uh, for 20 years, never a slice of pizza with that one. Anyway. And then website. Instagram, where, where my name. People, where they they listen, want more. Ooh, he's going Algeria on us. My my name's Steve Maraboli. I'm a really findable fella. You'll uh, you'll find my websites and Instagrams and that. Yeah, stuff. you know Algeria, right? Yeah, he yeah, gave yeah. us one of those great lines. We're like, so Algeria, tell everyone where to find. He was like, well, my name's Chris Algeria, so yeah. Google it. <laughs> I, I'm reminded. So well, back, ChrisAlgeria.com. Back yeah. in the '70s and '80s, this big guru guy, when that mysticism really hit the the East here. Uh, the the West anyway for them one of the big guru guys was Ram Das right mm -hmm. and he was this big huge guru and people would fill Central Park just to listen to this guy talk and they said well how do we find you how do we find you Ram Das he said I'm in the phone book under Das <laughs> I want to be like that yeah. so I'm a pretty findable fella uh, my websites it's my fucking cell phone number so people call, I fucking answer. I'm in airports a lot. I respond to messages. I you engage. I engage. You need man. that. I'm a, you need I'm that. A, I'm a ch child of Chilean Italian immigrants, born and raised in the USA, and I'm a decorated combat veteran. And I do jujitsu, and I have friends and family, and I just happen to know I, I've cut away enough of the bullshit where my my mixture of high level business and high level behavioral science, that little marriage. I'd be able to create a product that has helped millions of people. Well, you definitely have a future client here. I'm sure Menace could use some help as well. But yeah, even now, we, we've talked. Device. We didn't Menace. get into it at all about how you work with. How'd you wind up working with Longo? Quick before we get out of here. Uh, I just went to the gym. I was 225 pounds and not any taller, and I needed to lose some weight. So yeah. you started out there. Well, so we can I, get more of it. I, yeah, I'm just I giving started, a little build I up to it. I just started hitting things and, and uh, started hitting like with uh, Jenny Nadell, who's, who to this day my dear, dear friend, uh, also pro kickboxer, champion pro kick, kickboxer. And I started hitting with her, and I bullshit with Ray. Ray's a shoot-from-the-hip type of guy. Those are my favorite people. Yeah, Jenny's one um, of those people I met in passing, but I, like Henzo, never heard a bad word. She, Always hear Ray might, reviews. She might be one of the greatest humans I've ever met. Yeah. I've heard and, really um, good and so, uh, um, again, the, as Longo says, the, the cage tells the truth. The cage is the truth. And people who have, who have sacrificed to me to that level, you know who they are. Yeah. Um, and I started, and we've been friends ever since, probably five or six years now. Doing right the now. show together? How long have uh, you been doing we, that? Uh, he invited me in a, to a show he had going on. Uh, I forget the name. I think it was called Training Day with Ray. He invited me on, and... Uh, we kind of hit it off and thought maybe we should do a show together. Yeah, so. so. And what's the name of your guys' show? MMA and Beyond. And then you guys do that on we do Sundays? That, yeah, we do it on Sunday nights. We, we, we let it out Monday morning. So it's. And Ray's on another podcast also. He's He does a short snippet on the Anik and Florian podcast. Mm -hmm. um, and he's Ray Longo, man. Yeah. You know, he's, yeah. he's Ray Longo. He's and always then, saying something. Well, your guy, all your, your podcasts on every podcast. Yeah, it's at everywhere podcast. podcasts are. All right, beautiful. So, yeah, we're going to do an episode. Hopefully, we'll stay in touch. We're going to try yeah. to get an episode in with you and Ray. And, yeah, uh, yeah we appreciate Come you for giving, your, giving us your time oh, here. You know. that's, that's your gym too. Amazing information that you, you gave us. So Thank you, everyone, for listening. Everybody, please go back, listen to this episode a few times, and learn some positive reinforcement type stuff that you can get use here. Get out of your own way. Get out of your own way, everybody. Yep. Press so, close. Steve Maraboli, everyone check him out. Dennis the Menace Bermuda, Stan the Man. We'll see you guys Saturday at the NYFE. And hope you guys enjoyed episode 31. Well, see you later.